hope you all appreciate it. Uh, nice, beautiful picture of Landsat 8 there, ensuring <laughs> that, that uh, nice. round robin, uh, which is also going to be Landsat 9, since 9 is a copy of 8. Uh, so I am Pete Doucette from the National Land Imaging Program, USGS, uh, basically a bureaucrat out in DC these days. Um, I know there's several USGS folks in the audience that are going to be presenting later, and I think, I think they're going to go a little deeper. I'm going to speak at a fairly high level, like any good bureaucrat will do. Um, and why don't we get started? I want to thank Ignacio and Susan for, for co-hosting. Okay, so the uh, USGS uh, mission areas here, half a dozen, uh, many people are familiar with these. It's basically a lot of the environmental land-based stuff, right? Energy and minerals, ecosystems, hazards. Water resources, land resources, and core sciences. So land resources is where uh, the Landsat program sits in Eros, out in Sooth, uh, it sits, you know, Eros sits under that as well as the, the headquarters component among other things. But actually water, you wouldn't think, but or maybe you would these days, water is, is the big, from a budget perspective, has got the biggest budget across the missionaries at USGS. So Earth map, it's the grand challenge, the mother of all ARD stack problems, whatever you know adjective you want to use here to try to describe it. So this was a vision that came out of a workshop that USGS held among its senior scientists a couple of years ago. There's a published report on it, but this is kind of like the centerpiece graphic for it, right? So it's, it's the mother of all stacks, right? Everything Earth related. And uh, as you can see here, I mean, it's, it's big on concept. Implementation is, is a huge lift for this kind of thing, as we all know, right? So it's, it's about stacking uh, heterogeneous Earth data sets to get to this holy grail of integrated predictive science. Earth map stands for, you can see it there, that, that top box. Earth monitoring, analyses, and projections, or in other words, forecasting, or predictions. Um, that's the holy grail to inform decision making. Um, and so what we do with Landsat and when, within the land change science community, obviously feed some of these layers, right? Like the land surface and possibly uh, uh, fauna and some other things here. So we think what we're doing with, with Landsat, with ARD, and I'll get to LC map, land change monitoring, assessment projection, is really foundational to getting this thing going in the right direction. Uh, and as I heard among, among the 10 uh, presenters, a lot of key issues about uncertainty. Uh, platform was, was obviously a big issue right now. There's, there's a, a lot of different things to pick from. Um, so before I get there, but I'll, I'll cover a little of the, uh, the politics right now that are kind of giving momentum to this Earth map vision relevance to the administration, uh, which in my opinion transcend any, whoever's in the White House, these are all things that will have, have long life to them. Critical minerals, these executive orders that have come out in recent months to uh, last year or two on critical minerals, wildfire risk, projecting that, predicting that. Uh, the executive order on maintaining American leadership in AI uh, and infrastructure. There's some others, but, but these are critical because you do need the political support at the end of the day. So cloud hosting solutions, or CHS, that's what we call our uh, vehicle that through which the entire bureau goes through to get to cloud. And this is their poster here on the left that I took from their website. Uh, you can see a lot of things hanging off that. Again, this is kind of visionary, and we are migrating slowly but surely. You can see in the upper right there, Pangeo. So I didn't hear anybody talk about Pangeo. That's relatively new. Right? I think that was kicked off in 2018. It's essentially an environment of sorts where you have software tools and data uh, being developed by, the op by an open source community. So yet you know, another platform to consider, you know, along with you know, Open Data Cube, uh, Google Earth Engine, you get Amazon uh, Earth Data Portal. I mean, there, somebody was saying that you know, just choosing the right platform going forward is key, and, and it really is, because right now we're all trying to struggle to determine what is that going to be. So you can see in blue text that at least according to our uh, Office of Enterprise Information, that's our IT uh, component for the Bureau, uh, they, I'm quoting here, they say that for USGS to operate as a 21st century scientific organization, we need an IT platform that provides virtually unlimited storage and compute capabilities, right? Not going to do that on-prem. Only major public cloud service providers can support this environment, okay? So for the record, we know we have to go to cloud. We're getting there with Landsat. We're not there officially yet, but we're slowly migrating Landsat Archive to cloud. And as you know, it already exists in some of the cloud vendors today. So it's partly my job to inform our CHS group that there are these other things called ARD, AIML, and Stack that also need to be hanging off 
this the CHS service, right? They're, they're, they're key to it. They're key to the Earth map vision. So uh, let me start with uh, changing gears here with the Sustainable Land Imaging Program. This is the new umbrella program under which Landsat now falls. It's a joint relationship or agreement between NASA and DOI through the USGS, right, to develop a multi-decadal approach to maintaining essentially a sustainable land imaging program, right? It's a long-term commitment, which the Landsat program has not been, you know, up, up until basically the signing of this agreement. It's been a series of one-offs, more or less. So this is about making a long-term commitment, uh, keeping the data record compatible with what's, on, what's in the archive. It starts with Landsat 9. That's the official mission, if you will, th to start this sustainable land imaging program. So the way we uh, distribute the roles is NASA is responsible for the, state, the space segment, as well as responsible for looking into future tech assessment. USGS responsible for the ground system development and you know, back end once, once NASA develops, puts onto orbit, they kind of metaphorically hand over the keys to USGS and we take it from there. USGS also responsible for assessing the future needs of the data. So many of you know about the record SLI, Sustainable Land Imaging, is about maintaining cap capability or, co or compatibility, I should say, back to 1972. Landsat 7 and 8 continue to operate today. Landsat 7 will run out of maneuvering fuel by 2020, 2021 timeframe, at which time we hope to replace it with Landsat 9, right? We're still on course for end of 2020 calendar year launch. And our architecture study team for Landsat Next, we call it, or Landsat 10, if you will, uh, has has been doing its investigation for the past close to a year now, uh, targeting a mid-2020s launch for Landsat 10. Some of the spectral characteristics I'll cover, a lot of you know this, here, here we are looking at the Landsat 8 spectral band passes and 9, right? So 9 will be, in effect, a copy of 8 with some, with some enhancements, but in effect, all of the, uh, the spectral band passes will, will remain as, as they are in 8. Backward compatible with 7, and here's where Sentinel-2 is, which was by design Landsat-like. And so harmonization, uh, there are now efforts underway to do that. NASA has been leading that. There are harmonization products. I think that was brief last year. I wasn't here, but I think it was brief. And, uh, you know, of course, Sentinel-2 has got the red edge bands that, Sentinel, that Landsat does not, but does not have the thermal bands that Landsat does. So that's been an interesting dynamic in terms of, you know, planning the future for, for SLI and Landsat-10. Here's the orbitology between Landsat and Sentinel-2, very similar. And the SmallSat community, this is painting kind of a broad brush. They're roughly in this part, part of the spectrum here with GSDs of 1 to 5. And, you know, I've been listening to Ignacio for, for a while now, the Super Dove. They're going to start going into, you know, more uh, progressively in the spectral domain. So we're very excited to see where that goes. And Landsat-10, where are we going with that spectrally? And actually GSD and a few other metrics I put here. So, so this is from, this is, this is out on the web. This is the draft SLI uh, science requirements for a global survey mission, right? Th these were published to kind of provoke discussion or invite discussion across the community for what a Landsat 10 or Landsat Next could look like in terms of what bands are we, are we looking to add, what GSDs are we looking to improve to. Uh, so what I painted there in yellow are kind of the delta uh, relative to what exists today with Landsat 8, right? So this is where we could go. This is not the spec for Landsat 10, okay? This was informed by user requirements and other various inputs. And this is what was published again to kind of spark discussion, see what the user community and development community thinks. I don't know if you can read any of this, but you know, you see some, some red edge bands, a water vapor band kind of mimicking to some extent what Sentinel-2 does, some more swear bands, a couple more uh, tier bands, um, so, again, everything is still on the table for what Landsat 10 could be. The architecture study team will be providing their recommendations probably by the end of the year, right? But we're still, we're looking at a mid-2020s launch, so, you know, things could still change, but everything's still on the table. In terms of revisit, revisit frequency, some of the user feedback led us to these conclusions here. Minimum of three days. And by the way, we are looking at what we call the goal or the high end of the requirements that we're looking at. We did put together a base or a uh, kind of a low end threshold minimal set of requirements. I'm just showing you the goal or the higher end. Uh, so the visit re 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 revisit frequency, 
Three days viewing angle less than 20 degrees off nadir required at 10, 15, plus or minus 15 minutes mean local time crossing. There are no plans to change the free and open data policy. Okay, those of you who may have been tracking that for the past year, there are no plans to do that. So free and open in 2008, you can see the exponential download rate of Landsat over the past decade or so. 2011, we surveyed the users, did a, an economic valuation of the Landsat archive at 2.2 billion. This is all published. We recently updated that. It's going to be published probably within the year. It now has it at 4.2 billion annual economic benefit. That's annual. That's that's global, right? So it easily pays for the mission. It's based on this contingent valuation method, which is probably losing its uh, robustness in terms of evaluating uh, a value because it's based on download rates, right? And so the trends are clearly going towards more, more towards staying in the cloud, doing your compute there, right? So th this method will probably have to evolve with that in, in, the, in the future. And that arrow at the bottom, this only includes downloads from, from USGS Arrows Data Center. Does not include where, uh, the, the commercial cloud vendors. And we know, anecdotally, tons of data is being downloaded, or at least used, for example, in Google Earth Engine. Right? People aren't downloading. They're staying there, and they're, they're doing their analysis. So um, we know the download rates are significantly, or the use rates, significantly higher than what we're measuring from, from Arrows. Okay, so Landsat level one, two, and some metadata products that I think you're all familiar with. The, the level one on the left there, the top of atmosphere reflectance, and the surface reflectance level two. This is the traditional, what I'll call traditional path row. It takes on the orientation of, of the orbit. And we do provide metadata. Here's the cloud metadata. We have other metadata such as cloud shadows, ice, snow, these kinds of things, as well as uncertainty data. Somebody mentioned that, right? We're, we are providing that. As, a, as part of the QA band. And here's the definition, at least as it stands today, for the, the Landsat US analysis ready to do. So it's, this, is, this is a US product only, although people do want global, but it's US today. So you can see it's a tile-based uh, uh, structure. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the traditional band, or the, uh, the orbit, you know, where it's, it's clipping out from the orbit and populating the tile there. The projection is on Albers, Albers equal area. It's not on UTM, which is what the path row is. Um, we have separate parameters there between CONUS, Alaska, and Hawaii. And uh, level, it, it consists of level one, or two, sorry, surface reflectance, surface temperature, where the, I'll call it the raw data. I was having this talk with Steve LeBon earlier. The, some, levels, some level of level zero data, I'll call it. It's being, in terms of its projection, it's being reprojected directly from its raw or its L0 state, so we're not double sampling, right, from a UTM level one, just so, so everybody's aware of that. We're using collection one data, tier one, where tier one is filtered out uh, uh, scenes, if, or, or the data, I guess, such that the, uh, the geocal is better than 12 meter radial uh, RMSE. And here's the, the tile, the, or the, the grid structure. The tiles are 5,000 by 5,000 pixel, and you can see, you know, with each pass, a tile is populated to facilitate stacking in time series, right? And that's where we all know, you know, ARD is going in terms of what community it's serving, or at least a pretty big one, is the time series analysis. In addition to the level two products, there are now some level three products that are online. They're available today through Eros. You can see the dynamic surface water extent, fractional soap, snow cover, and burned area. These are thematic, they're semantic information, right? So this is level three. Some of the user needs uh, we've been um, eliciting on, on ARD, a lot of the stuff we've talked about, those bullets at the bottom there, and they need consistent format, tiling scheme, geometry, uh, Landsat ARD greatly improves time series. Interest in a GEE-like capability. I don't know if Tyler likes hearing me say that. But <laughs> Uh, he's, why don't you just come to us? <laughs> uh, and the, of course, desire for a global ARD, right? So to date, there is no unanimous preference, you can see there, the bottom bullet, for a single cartographic projection for global ARD. The LST has been looking at this, the Landsat Science team has been looking at this for a couple of years. There's no real consensus to date that you know, would, would enable me to, to tell you today what, what it is. So uh, it's leaning towards a UTM type of approach, but the USARD is Albers. 
Uh, sinusoidal has been, been talked about. Nobody really is too crazy about that from an aesthetic standpoint. But anyway. So the end of the uh, cost and uh, uh, frugal era of Landsat, you know, pre-2008, uh, leads us to this era of uh, free and open ARD time series analysis, right? So back in the day, you know, when you could do change detection with what you could afford, maybe it was a couple of scenes, you know, pretty limited in what you can do for assessing change. Fast forward to today, you've got all the observations available to you could free and open made that possible. And now we can do some fancy regression analysis using harmonics to fit the kind of change that we know is going on in the data that you could never do with a, with a couple of scenes, right? You can take the coefficients from that regression fit, train an XG boost, which is what we use, decision tree classifier, to then classify in, in spectral time space, if you will, a class type. So you've got seasonal change going on, obviously, but you may not have semantic change going on in terms of what's the cover type. So that's what this CCDC, altogether, this continuous change detect, it's continuous because you're fitting continuous functions to it and you're doing classification with it. So you're detecting uh, seasonal change, you're detecting breaks in cover type, and you're classifying those types. Very powerful technique. This ARD is critical to, to, to this being a reality. Takes us to the LC map approach, right? The land change monitoring assessment and projection. Again, there's your CCD kind of piecewise uh, uh, polynomial fit or, or harmonic fit breaking it out into the various classes. Where we're going with this, um, and you can see the citation at the bottom there. This was developed at Boston University. The CCD algorithm was by Zhe Zhu as his PhD thesis. So just an amazing thing for a PhD student to have his thesis become the, the engine of a major government program. Here you see uh, the LC map product on the right. It's, it's updating in an annual frequency, showing you the change, in this case, of thematic or semantic information. Right? You can see the class labels at the top there. You can see uh, you, we can better understand what's going on in this particular area, expansion of urban uh, and agricultural classes in the Tri-Cities there. So you see those crop circles kind of filling in towards the bottom. And then you can see the urban growth in, in red. So, this is kind of the end state of, of, of LC map. I think uh, Ignacio is kind of giving me the hook here. So where we're going next, and, th and this uh, hopefully in late uh, this year, is our first suite of LC map products, version one. You can see it's a suite of 10 different products. They're basically land cover and land change type products. The citation below there, that paper is currently in review. It goes into all the details behind how this data is generated. So you got primary land cover and primary confidence, secondary land cover, secondary, and, and so on. Model quality gets into a lot of, of, of metrics and, and metadata. The validation data set that went along with the LC map uh, uh, suite uh, will also become available uh, as public data, I'm hoping, shortly. It's a, uh, a database of 25,000 pixels. So here's your label stuff that somebody was talking about earlier in terms of the machine learning piece. And projection, which is the P part of LC map, right? So this kind of gives you a sense of where we're going with this. This is not based on LC map per se today, but here you see a projection scenario of assessing, you know, what could happen as the Ogallala aquifer declines, cotton, which is much more dependent on water and irrigation than other crops, you'd see a, a drop off of, of cotton crops in favor of other grasses that, that are less dependent on irrigation. So again, it's kind of a scenario. It's a possible outcome of what you can do with understanding what happened in the past, projecting out. Here's another projection scenario, increasing uh, what would be needed to support a you know, biofuel production, to increase the, the dry biomass, biomass of various grasses. And what you can see in pink there, it's not cotton was in the last video. This is now perennial grass. You can see the uh, the growth rate of that over, and this is going out to 2100. It uses climate models, so this is kind of one of these long-term models. But just to give you a flavor of what ARD and Stack, you know, feeds LC map, and an LC map bigger picture feeds this kind of projection scenario capability. So just a quick few words on AIML. Everybody's kind of euphoric about it right now. It's a lot of buzz about jargon that's really been around for decades, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so. More often than not, when people are talking about AIML these days, they're talking about deep learning neural nets. That's where a lot of the momentum is going. 
which it's not the Terminator, it's not the Matrix, it's not Skynet, it's basically what it always has been, minimizing a cost function using a grad gradient descent type method. That hasn't changed, okay? And a lot of uh, the momentum behind deep learning neural nets these days is for, for image processing is CNNs or convolutional neural nets. Again, been around for decades, right? What is driving AI ML towards neural nets is this simple graph here. You can see uh, there's two, this is just notional graph. There aren't any, any, any numbers on the axes here, but it's notional. That kind of makes the point. So the green, the green bar is, is indicating kind of the improvement of what I'll refer to as other machine learning methods, such as decision tree, support vector machines, et cetera, where the blue are neural nets, deep learning neural nets. And you can see that circa 80s and 90s, uh, neural nets were not really competing. It was, a, it, was a, it was a fast and furious development age of neural nets, but they never really measured up. But over time, with the advent of big compute, big training, they've now surpassed the more traditional methods, in some areas at least, and that trend is widening, as you can see here. So neural nets haven't changed in terms of how they get modeled, in terms of the base model. What has changed are the size of those models, how many neurons and layers, and how much data we can feed them when we, and we have the compute to back it. And they're performing at a much higher rate than the traditional methods. Still the black box that they always were. Nobody can exactly explain why they'd perform better. They've always been a black box. That hasn't changed. But if you want the performance, you'll get it in many instances. So we've always known that more training would lead to, to better accuracies. For those of you who've been around remote sensing for a while, you've probably seen this graph published back in 1969, the Hughes effect, also known as the curse of dimensionality. And so what Hughes published back in, in, in 68, actually, uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the horizontal axis is measurement complexity. Vertical axis is mean recognition accuracy. So as the measurement complexity increased, you know, your accuracy, it kind of reached some kind of a peak, you know, in performance. And then as the measurement complexity continues to, to increase, the performance actually goes down. So dimensionality reduction was a big thing, right, for the 80s, 90s, and 2000s to try to find that intrinsic dimensionality. But now that, that kind of top, sorry, that top part of this graph here where training data quantity is now exceeding levels, you know, beyond what we've ever seen before. We're now getting at that uh, sample pattern size essentially going towards infinity, right? And so that kind of has an open-ended curve there for mean recognition accuracy. So we've got to start better understanding how to be applying AI ML specifically, deep learning nets, they're mostly applied towards spatial type applications today, but towards time series. I think that, that that's a very ripe area right now. I'm gonna wrap up with my concluding thoughts. The first two bullets, kind of the, the, the no-brainers, right? ARD stack, critical or time series, LC map and earth map that I showed you are absolutely dependent on, on ARD and stack. The use of public cloud is not optional, it really isn't. In fact, uh, I put multi-cloud there with a question mark. I think multi-cloud is the future. You know, we're, we're trying to get there in steps, but we'll see where that goes. Um, discernment, of observation, density, and frequency, and um, underlining uncertainty and error propagation. I want to foot stomp that. That's going to be key that we capture that so we understand how it propagates to this uh, s projection scenario type modeling that I, that I showed you. Because if we don't understand the uncertainty, projections will possibly be worthless. Right? And that last bullet, you need to discern the applicability of, of deep learning neural nets. Uh, to apply to time series ARD stacks. And that's the future of, of uh, the next level of ARD is level three, right? Because it's labeled data. And that's what feeds machine learning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Beautiful talk. Uh, Peter, you're next. Do we have your talk? For yeah. Okay, oh, let's go back.
Mm. How do you go to the beginning? Yeah, just go to the next beginning. Hopefully it starts. Okay, so this presentation is going to go a little bit, definitely more into the technical details. Uh, what I was wanted to do was to give a discussion about uh, formats for analytical ready data. So um, what I want to first do is sort of give a very high level slide of you know what is ARD, and this is sort of my interpretation of it. Uh, we have source data, or users have source data. We have auxiliary data. We perform some form of pre-processing, and we create this ARD data. Uh, we, as well as meta information, and then from that we have two choices. We either run analytics against it to create a, an additional product, maybe an additional raster, or it might actually be um, temp, you know, uh, tabular data. Alternatively, we t utilize a service, and that service is then used to provide access to that data. So for ARD, in my, in my definition, I'm going to refer to it as really the 16-bit per pixel data, um, typically surface reflectance, signed integers, and the requirement typically at the moment is lossless compression, um, plus some form of a mask for the data. And what I'm going to be focusing on is these, um, the, the parts what I'm showing in, in uh, orange here, which is really the creation of the ARD data, how long it takes to generate that ARD data in, into the particular formats, how that format is stored, and then how fast it is to actually access that data. And you might ask why. And when you actually look at the volumes we're talking about, I mean, ARD data sets we're talking about in the petabytes very quickly. Uh, petabyte of storage nowadays is about $240,000 a year to store in cloud, public cloud storage. That's typically the cost of it. If you wanted to read that data um, at, uh, I'm just giving you some, some rough figures, just if you wanted to generally just read the data and do nothing else, you're talking about $1,000 approximately just to read the data. So obviously, if you have data you're reading it multiple times, uh, those costs go up pretty quick. So we talk about raster formats. What do I mean of a raster format? Well, it's a combination of a couple of things. One is the structure of the data. Um, then the compression of the data. How is the data compressed? And there are a no number of options that I'll be talking to. There's also the concept of pyramids with the data. How are those pyramids created? Should they even be there for ARD data? And I'll, I'll quickly talk about those. So I'm going to be talking about various formats, typically what I call stripped TIFF, which is really just raw TIFF files, tile TIFF, COG, which many of you know, know about, um, MRF, CRF, and JPEG 2000 as being primary uh, raster formats that we want to discuss. So let's just quickly look at look at one look at those. So from the raster formats for tiled, um, there is the aspect of tiling of the imagery. There's the aspect of the compression of the imagery and the and the pyramids of the imagery. And this slide is just going to go through different different formats to sort of explain briefly what each of those are. So the stripped TIFF is really just TIFF files with one pixel straight after the other. There is no tiling internally. It's just the, the pixels after the other. And typically, you may have some meta information at the beginning or the end of the file. Compare that with something like NetCDF, HDF, or GRIB, files like that. They, you have metadata. You have the data typically cut up into some form of a tiles or cubes, and you often have the indexes mixed around it. You can imagine as I read any part of it, I have to read different parts of the image. It becomes relatively slow to read. Take a JPEG 2000 file. That's structured slightly different. You have the metadata. You actually have a pyramid and the, the, the high-resolution data combined together, and there's like an indexes which go between it. Again, to read any particular pixel, I actually have to read different parts of the images, which makes it relatively slow to, slow to read. Take that to tiled TIFF, which has been around for, I mean, at least 10 years, uh, where you have the metadata, you have the index to a bunch of tiles, and then after that, you actually have the pyramids. So the indexes point to the pyramids, um, to the, the tiles, and the pyramids. Take that COG, Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF is really just tiled TIFF. All they do, or we do, is we move the pyramids to the front and the metadata, all the metadata and the indexes to the front to enable a faster access to the, um, in the first request very often includes that information. And another format is MRF, Meta Raster Format. That actually splits the file into three different files. It actually keeps the metadata as a separate file, which can be very quickly accessed, a separate index file, and then the data file similar to something like COG or Tile TIFF. So those are sort of just explaining briefly the structure of those files and wh why does that make a difference? How does this actually affect, affect performance? 
Well, one thing to consider is the compression. We need, to, we need compression for various reasons. One, we want to reduce the storage, but we also want to reduce the transfer. And as you see later, it actually has an effect on, on the performance, but we need to weigh that between the compression we get and how long we're going to spend compressing or decompressing the data. If we spend too long compressing or decompressing the data, the, the value is, has, is limited. So we have different options. One is none, no compression. Deflate, which is popular, it's actually the default method in COG, um, but it does have some soft um, issues with some older software. There's LZW, which is actually faster to compress, but actually slower to, def um, to decompress than deflate. There is Lurk, which I'll come back to and talk a, talk a little bit about later. And then there's JPEG 2000, which provides pr the highest general compression, but certainly requires a lot more um, CPU to uh, uh, read and write. Then there's the aspect of the pyramids. I won't go too much into this, but when we create pyramids, or pyramids are needed, not really for any analysis. Most people don't do analysis on the pyramid data. It's really typically used for providing a quick view of the data. And there are various ways that those pyramids could be created. One is not to have any pyramids. And if you're doing analytics, maybe you shouldn't be using the pyramids anyway. The second one is to use nearest neighbor, uh, but has the problems that you use, well, you maintain the radiometry, but you very often get a grainy, grainy output. And the file size actually increases more than 1.3. It's probably more near, near typically 1.4. Same with averaging, where you average the pixels, you maintain a better quali visual quality, but you're, you're using, using some radiometry values. You can actually do averaging by a factor of three, and actually, or, or weighted, uh, which actually gives is, is a, is a, is a, has advantages, and the size goes down a bit. You can actually do average two and skip the first overview. Again, we're now adding only about 10% to the data volume. Alternatively, you could actually use a lossy compression, although the source data, you may say, needs to be lossless. Maybe it makes sense to actually use lossy compression on the overviews because you can reduce the size. And the second, third question, another question to ask is, should, the tif should those overviews be integral in the same file, or could they be in a separate file? There are reasons why they should actually be a separate file. So one of the questions is, what? What are our overviews applicable for ARD for the analytical, uh, stress the analytical ready data, um, or should they um, be excluded, or should they be part of a separate file? The next thing is MRF, it's a format I've, I've mentioned a number of times. It's a, it refers to as meta raster format. It's a high performance cloud, well, raster storage system. It's integrated into GDAL. It really ex abstracts the pyramid and tiling from the user. Um, it enables the, the, it actually split into three files for good reason. It actually enables the system to actually better cache the metadata in the index. You have to realize that the small files actually get cached by a system, whilst a large range request will, doesn't get cached not only by your system, but the various parts of the, parts of the whole, um, or the whole parts of the system. It allows different compression methods, non deflate, PNG, Lurk, JPEG, as well, as well as something we call JPEG Zen, which is actually the ability to actually have a no data mask as part of the, uh, as part of the JPEG. It's um, simple to read, and there's actually just read it. Um, there's, there's, plenty, there's a JavaScript reader that can read um, um, MRF very easily, and it's also integrated into GDAL, so it's basically part of the open source. Another thing I've talked about is Lurk. Lurk is a limited error raster compression. It actually provides controlled lossy compression. So it gives you the ability to, I say I want to compress the data, and I don't want a value to change over more than a certain range from the source value. And that's important. In this case, in all the examples, I'm turning the compression, I mean, the tolerance to zero, in other words, lossless. But with Lurk, you can actually define a, a range and say the values can't be more than, let's say, 10 centimeters from a, from a DEM, for things like that. So it's very, very good at highly compressing data, especially the sort of floating point and higher bit de depth data. It's a modern algorithm. It was actually originally patented by Esri, but we've released that patent to everybody. Um, so it provides really fast compression and decompression. You'll see those numbers coming out later. It certainly provides better lossless compression than anything else out there except for um, um, JPEG 2000. It certainly has better, has better compression. It has inbuilt no data handling. It's open source. Uh, and it's actually recently added as part of GDAL into TIFF. You can actually now with G, um, GDAL write TIFF using not only things like deflate or LZW, you can write TIFF with um, um, uh, Lurk compression. So what we did was some performance tests. We took some data sets. We actually, you'll see there are two data sets that I'm using. One is an ARD tile from the USGS, or rather a collection of those. And the other set is some Landsat scenes. Um, so 
They're different sizes. The ARD tiles are 5,000 by 5,000 pixels. The Nansen scenes are typically, uh, these are the, the, the uh, 15,000 by 15,000 pixels, so it's the pan panchromatic imagery. We, we selected the scenes with about 20% no data values, or rather the ARD tiles with about 20% no data values. And what we've done is also compressed it using different formats, different compressions, different infrastructure, but also using things like VSI and VSI curl uh, um, to, to look at what the di difference um, performance is. We used um, the 512 by 512 piles, tiles with pyramids and um, two times average compression. And for each image, or each raster rather, we read the source, we basically um, wrote it um, out in the defined format and recorded the time and the size. Then we actually copied it to S3 as a totally separate exercise. Then once it was in S3, we, or, um, we basically read the data, each raster, either a subset of the raster, just one small area, 1,000 by 1,000 pixels from the middle of the image, and recorded the time for that. And then we repeated that for the full data set. This was all done with Python scripts. It's just using GDAL, the latest version of GDAL, the OSGO uh, latest build of GDAL. It's using the um, JP2 Open JPEG 2 library, and uh, you see the machine in which it was used. It also, I have to um, uh, specify sets, actually the correct variables to improve the performance of the certain GDAL variables that you need to set to ensure that GDAL doesn't read uh, files unnecessarily. So just quick, this is just an overview of the um, storage and compression. Um, it's a bit hard to read there. I'll just highlight the key things that we see. One thing that's come again and again is the time to write COG is significantly more, which is something we have not investigated. You'll see this coming up a number of times. Um, the COG format certainly does require the restructuring of the data, and we're still surprised at how long it's been taking to actually restructure and create the COG files. So we'll see the times for COG are, are writing COG is significantly more. The JPEG 2000 provides about 45% better, percent better compre compression versus deflate, um, but it also takes a lot longer to write. Uh, Lurk, as, a, as an example here, gets about 12% more compression than, than deflate. If we look at actually writing the data and reading it from the ephemeral drives, so here on the, on the machines there are ephemeral drives. The ephemeral drive is essentially an SSD drive directly connected to the computer, so there is no basically extremely fast uh, um, um, transfer. And if you look at the compression, the, the times to create the files and to read the files, some interesting th things become uh, uh, um, ob um, uh, uh, visible. One is obviously the non-compressed data is the fastest because there is no compression to do. You're reading and writing and the speed of the read-write is nearly inf infinite in that case. The deflate um, is actually about 15% better compression, but it's about 2.4 times slower, um, but it's actually a little bit faster to decompress. The cog is still longer to write, which again surprises us because of the file format, because we're writing to a, um, a, a, essentially an SSD drive. Interesting about Lurk gets in this case, so uh, without, you know, um, with a very fast drive, we're getting about um, nearly two times faster to read um, than deflate. Um, but JPEG 2000 is significantly slower. So that's showing really the CPU load of JPEG 2000 and how that is putting significant reduction in the perf performance. Uh, if you look at the actual performance of those reads, we're talking about between 20 to 750 megabytes per second um, on those, from, from those um, dr um, drives. So let's actually move the data now to S3 and see how that actually affects the performance. So when the data is in S3, we can actually um, read the data in, in, in uh, using two methods. One is VSI curl, and the other one is VSI S3. So one, the VSI S3 essentially includes authentication, whilst the VSI curl doesn't. A couple of things I actually haven't really been going through some of the values here. I've got TIFF non, TIFF deflate, TIFF um, um, LZW. Um, I've also got COG deflate, and I've got COG lurk. Cog lurk is really just using cog, but I've just replaced the deflate with lurk just to see what happens, uh, what, 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 how the performance um, changes. I've also here used MRF lurk and MRF split, lurk split. What I mean by lurk, lurk split is that the actual index and the metadata files are stored locally. It's only the large, which are very small, it's only the large data value files which are actually um, stored in S3. So just a little bit ex explanation of what, what's going on there. So again, what you see is that the when you're reading the complete file, the MRF is actually two times faster, which corresponds to what we were seeing before. 
When we're reading a subset of the data, um, the speed is actually slightly slower because we actually have to do multiple reads unless we actually use the split. And the split means that we don't actually have to read the index, the separate files, because the, 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 the index is actually stored locally, so it's, it's Im immediately accessed. So this actually shows a, li a little bit a bit about the differences in performance that we get. The other interesting thing here to realize is that using VSIS3, in other words, using the authentication, actually adds about uh, 15% to the total time to read, assuming you're reading the whole file, um, but it actually adds about 80% additional time if you're just reading a subset. And that actually, when you think about it, actually makes sense because the amount, the number of times the authentication actually has to, has to take place. So just, just re realize that the authentication does actually um, slow things down a bit. So just as sort of some conclusions and recommendations. One, well, I certainly we can discuss this. I'm sure there'll be some discussions about COG and stuff for ARD. The question is, should we, should pyramids actually be included. Um, they take a long time, the way they're written at the moment, they take a long time to write, and I should basically consider to basically put them as separate files. COG is certainly good. I'm not suggesting that we change COG. Just realize that it's not necessarily the optimum for reading the data, um, but the, what the performance shows is it's, it's very, very good. Um, certainly, my recommendation is to keep the the rasters as large scenes. Uh, you'll see that in some of the, uh, some of the requests. As you cut the, up the, the, the data into smaller tiles, it actually takes longer to actually read the data. It's actually better to read this, 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 the, keep the files as large scenes, in my view, and not tile them up. And the other thing to do is to ensure that no data is properly clarified. That's not actually always totally um, defined at the moment. How do you define no data correctly? You can't use a zero as no data value, and everybody's using slightly different values. So it needs to be determined how no data is correctly defined. The other thing we're also seeing very often is these data sets is that they need some form of a vector extent of the data and not just a mask. When you actually look at the compute, you'll see that it actually makes a big difference if there is some form of a, of a, of a mask. And the other thing is certainly consider formats such as MRF and LERC. Uh, certainly, I'm, I'm all for standardizing or whatever, is, whatever the, the community thinks is better, but certainly just consider the, the advantages of those. A couple of other things I wanted to, to, to highlight is that from a, from, a op, from a format and optimization perspective, neither COG nor MRF, whether it's with pyramids or without pyramids, is actually optimum when we start talking about multidimensional data. It is one of the optimum formats for reading slices of data or layers of data um, but for such formats are actually relatively slow to read. If you want to do a temporal review of a stack of data and want to do a profile through data, then those data sets, even if they're tiled, they sp it takes a lot of requests to actually read it. You have to make, you know, if you have a thousand images to read, you're going to make at least a thousand requests to S3, and each one of those has a latency. So it is going to be slow. So. To look into that, uh, what we've actually done at Esri is I actually have a, another format. It's an open format, or it's rather it's a, it's a publicly defined format. It's similar to what we call TPK, which is a tile packet format. Um, it's just, and that's our format that we use for cache data. It's an open format. All this does is add additional bands and bit depths to it. So it splits the data into bundles, and each bundle has a set number of tiles, and then each bundle has its own index. And this is actually a very efficient way of handling very, very large files. So it's typically done not for a single scene. It's really for, for done if you want to take an elevation data of the whole world or something like that. How do you store and access that type of data? And that's how we use a CR, um, CRF. So it's great. It basically enables multiple processes, processes to write simultaneously to a single file, which is not possible with something like TIFF. Uh, it's very good for large rasters. It's not really, well, some of the disadvantages, it creates lots of individual files, uh, so it's not, um, so that's one of the disadvantages. I certainly wouldn't recommend it for um, s small, small rasters. So as part of that, what we also do uh, within ArcGIS is to work on what we call multidimensional rasters, and this is really about how we actually manage these different images. So we take the rasters, irrespective of what format they're in or what projection they're in, um, as well as things like NetCDF, and we load those into what we call a mosaic data set. A mosaic data set is really just a database structure which references all the files, but also defines the processing to be performed to transform that, um, that data into a particular product. And that is used as a multidimensional raster. Those, those, those slices or items within that mosaic data set can be multiple dimensions, and therefore, from an API perspective, you can just make a query and say, I want to find the anomaly or whatever it is, and it'll go through and, and determine that. 
to optimize the data, very often it's better to, for a subset of the data is to extract the data into uh, basically a CRF, which is a multidimensional and has all the different slices in it. But then what we also do is we transpose the data, which basically means rotate the complete data set. And now reading through time is equivalent to reading through a um, reading along one row of a raster. So it gives you instantaneous ability to see temporal, uh, temporal slices. So this ability to sort of take a subset, extract it into a very optimum, very fast format, allows very fast and efficient analysis. It's not necessarily the format you, know, you, want, to, you want to store your ARD catalog in, um, but it's a great format for extracting it to enable very fast analysis. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. And uh, the results of this are available. The, the slides will be available. All those test programs will also be available. So and I'm very happy to discuss all the, any, any aspects of, of this research. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Chris Holmes from Radiant and Planet simultaneously. Awesome. Thanks, Ignacio. Um, so yeah, like uh, Ignacio mentioned, I come with a couple hats. Uh, Planet is the majority of my time. Uh, also a technical fellow at Radiant Earth that funds a good bit of my stack time, although Planet thankfully helps me uh, work on it as well. Um, and then I also sit on the board of the OGC. Um, so you'll see some of that uh, interspersed throughout. Um, so today we wanted to talk about the state of spatial temporal asset catalogs. Uh, thankfully, I don't have to fit everything into this talk because Matt Hansen's going to give a talk uh, maybe like an hour or less after this. Well, he'll go deep into uh, many of the details that all kind of gloss over. So uh, after those two talks, you can pepper us with lots of questions. Um, so. Uh, and I think many of you sort of already know Stack. It seems like it's generally pretty uh, aware. Um, so I'm mostly going to jump into um, you know, what we've done in the last year. Um, but uh, uh, so can we get an image? Well, I'll talk to this even if it doesn't show up since I know what the slide is. Uh, imagine many little pictures of portals uh, that let you search for information. Um, <laughs> so the stack sort of started um, from a, a number of satellite providers, um, software providers, uh, that, that notion of finding satellite data, um, you know, you'd have to go to a whole bunch of different portals um, to, you know, find what you need um, and you weren't even sure that you had all of them. This is going to get old if I just have to remember my whole talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, I actually haven't gotten this part many times, so I will just continue to go. Oh, there we go. Uh, and then from a programmatic perspective, it's even worse. Uh, so everyone is just writing their own JSON REST, that's what I want, uh, RESTful APIs, uh, but they were all slightly different. Um, so somebody might use cloud cover, somebody might use Clyde underscore percentage, some might define that as zero to one, some might define that as zero to 100. Um, and you just have to write a special client for everyone. So essentially a bunch of us got together and decided, hey, let's try to make this a little better. Um, so uh, we really started off to make geospatial specs a bit differently. Um, like I said, I'm on the board of OGC, I've been involved in that type of making of specs, and I've also been involved in open source software a lot, and kind of saw some place to make specs in between. Um, so we really started with a set of core principles, really wanted to be JSON, RESTful, uh, small pieces loosely coupled, and, and really focused on uh, software first before making the standard. Um, and we remain kind of a group that just collaborates in this way. Um, so what is it? Uh, spatial temporal asset catalogs. Um, it's a specification. It's a language for geospatial catalogs and assets. We're really focused on search and discovery, and that's kind of the line that we draw. Um, you don't want to put all your metadata in here. We keep it simple and extensible, so uh, different domains can specify which, um, you know, the language that they want for their domain. Um, and there's a lot more details on, on the kind of aspects of this in, in Matt's talk coming up. Um, but what is it not? It's not a full-fledged metadata standard. Uh, we're not trying to be the single source of truth. Uh, we're not covering every single type of data set. 
and yeah, we're not trying to replace ISO 19115, um, OGC CSW, we're trying to, to be a layer that, that makes it easier to implement um, and to, to collaborate. Um, a whole bunch of people have been um, involved. Um, these are sort of varying degrees of involvement, but all of these have showed up at Sprint or sponsored or, or done something. And we've got 29 people on GitHub contributing, more than 10 have done at least 10 contributions. Um, so the main thing I want to dive into is this year of stack. Uh, so I gave a state of the stack talk last year, and this talk was actually really kind of fun to put together because it made me realize where we were at a year ago and really how far we've come in just one year. Um, so just going to kind of blitz through a number of different highlights in that time. Um, so we've done six releases. Um, we added collections. We added more data types. We've had a number of refinements. Uh, we're going to have 0.8.0 release pretty soon, hopefully end of August. Um, uh, over 700 commits um, onto GitHub uh, of people editing the spec and, and making it better and the examples. Um, this little graph is actually a bit off because we haven't merged dev to master and there's actually been a ton of work in the last month or two since the last sprint. Uh, we have a web page, which is really exciting. Uh, previously, if you found the spec, you had to look at uh, GitHub, which you know developers love, but nor people who are not developers uh, really like a nice explanation in a normal web page. Um, so got up that. That was a, a labor of love for me to, to make an accessible web page at stackspec.org. Um, we had a sprint at Planet, um, 23 people participating in person is our first doing remote participation um, in three days, and we're really focused on ecosystem into the, as an addition to the spec, which was great. Um, we had our first happy hour, thanks Climate Corp for hosting that, um, and it was a really nice kind of outreach event. We had lightning talks, uh, we had a number of participants that were not just people participating every day, but learning about it, uh, and I think we'll probably try to do more of these. Um, into tools, one of the favorite tools of mine is this Stack Lint. Um, Spark Geo uh, did a, work, a lot of work on validation, and they have this website where anybody can validate. And to me, that's one of the most important things for a spec. You know, don't make people read this whole specification um, and then like try to figure out if they're implementing it. Let them point at something online and let it know if it validates um, to help people. You know, and have this be the source of truth as opposed to uh, looking at every single line uh, of a lengthy specification. Um, so that's up and available and expanding to actually do extension validation too, which will be awesome. Um, uh, a lot of the original APIs have all progressed. Um, SAT APIs at uh, the latest of the specs, SAT Utils is growing. Matt's going to talk about these. Um, Staccato uh, was a Java API started by Boundless. It's now fully open source and is going to move to Planet Repo any day now. Um, OpenEO, Google Earth Engine have advanced. Uh, Seabers went from just a catal static catalog to a full API. Um, and then a number of new APIs. Um, so this guy, Jeff Albrecht, showed up at the last uh, sprint with Cognition Data Sources. Um, and it's actually a, a, a proxy onto non-stack compliant data sources. Um, so it, it returns, um, you know, stack compliant, but talks to all these different data formats. And some of them are programmatic, like the Planet one. It just uses the Planet Python climate. But uh, the coolest is that it can even talk to web pages. So it actually just goes and scrapes digital globes, open data, um, disaster stuff, which, you know, amazing that the data is out there, um, but you kind of have to go to the website, uh, you can check the preview, uh, you don't know where that is, um, and then it's a bunch of files. Um, so uh, now that's as a stack catalog, so this is served through Jeff's um, Cognition data sources. Um, this is through the stack browser view, uh, which gives you a little bit. Um, uh, you can see it in full resolution um, because it's a cloud optimized GeoTIFF streaming out. That's the way they're storing it. Um, and then you can zoom in and share that. Um, but then the other tools our show will also all talk to that same spot. Um, so, kind of putting in that standard format lets us show what these catalogs would be like. Um, before they're fully stackified. So a uh, really cool piece of software. Uh, Astrea showed up at the last sprint there. So we met them at the, the ARD workshop here last year. Um, and they uh, just released this Earth on Demand product that's all powered by a stack server, has this nice front end. They're doing cool work on aggregations. Um, and hopefully making that part of the standard. Um, so you can yeah, see those really fast responses. Uh, and it shows you the number of images that are there. Um, so yeah, they've 
been doing a lot of great contributions to the spec and have their own implementation. Um, Earth Search uh, from Element 84 is a hosted instance of SAT API um, that is cataloging all the data sets on Earth on AWS. And it's super cool too because it provides more of a carrot for uh, data providers on Earth on AWS, um, Amazon's kind of like, hey, if you implement Stack, then you get your data searched as opposed to just you know a static spot. Um, and so as people add more Stack catalogs to this, then they will show up in Earth Search, which is pretty awesome. Um, L3 Harris was there from the beginning, um, and they've actually transformed. Uh, they've been using a ton internally. Um, and it's powering three different products. They have over 200 million records in their stack catalog. Uh, they have this resale portal in TeleEarth. Uh, they're doing some full motion video um, cataloging in stack as well as some utility assets like the utility polls and all the information about that is actually um, in stack and, and in their external facing product. Um, Shifting gears to uh, the clients, um, Stack Browser sort of showed earlier. Um, this GIF is sort of highlighting one of the improvements we've made sense then, which is uh, make it easier to search. Uh, so to show up in Google, you'll see uh, from here, you can put an ID in, um, and then you actually get into the Stack browser directly. We've got more to do on this, but that's one of the goals is how do you make Stack show up in just normal web search? Um, so kind of getting those crawlers right in the Stack browser so anyone that publishes the core JSON fields can just get the browser and get it crawled. Um, still in progress, but uh, a lot of cool potential there. Um, and then QGIS plugin was one of the ones I had really been dreaming about. Um, and Kevin Booth at the last sprint came and had been working on this and released this a few weeks ago, I think. Um, so yeah, as you saw, it's fully in um, QGIS. You just go to QGIS, search for stack. It'll show up. You can download it, pull it in, um, start doing searches. Uh, I had an inordinate amount of trouble getting this GIF in for some reason, and it's a little downsampled, but um, it actually uh, lets you select the image in your area and your time, um, and then you can even select um, to stream it with Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF um, using the latest QGIS stuff there. So uh, this pan image that he's shown from Landsat is uh, streaming direct from the uh, probably the Earth on AWS. Um, and then uh, Devel Development Seed open sourced a, a browser, so this is a more interactive um, version, like that kind of traditional uh, go to a map, select an area. Um, and then this I actually did with this uh, animation with Jeff's cognition data sources. Um, so this is that DG open data, but you can see it on a map where it is as opposed to just web pages that you have to browse and um, can interact with it there. And this is open source release community um, will evolve. Uh, We've got a number of extensions. Matt's going to go deep into these, but yeah, I looked back a year ago and we had the EO one, and now there's many, many more. Uh, the one of the extensions I'm most excited about is actually the label extension. Um, so really taking, it was originally the training data, but has evolved to be more general because it can also be the results, uh, but it's associating an image with a, a set of JSON labels uh, for machine learning. And then they've taken a number of the open data sets. This is SpaceNet, um, kind of put them into the extension and are cataloging those. And I think ML Hub has uh, gonna do more and more uh, of this particular extension in Stack. Um, so yeah, number of public catalogs, and that's growing. Um, the other thing that's been super cool to see, and slightly surprising to me, is like even more than public data sets is internal use. Um, so uh, there's even many more than this that I didn't get permission beforehand to name, but um, Maxar is doing a lot of their internal catalog, redoing into Stack, um, EarthCast sort of similar. Um, and I don't think either of them have really public facing stuff yet, but you'll probably eventually see that. Um, Farmer's Edge and Climate Corp are more kind of using internally their public facing stuff as an imagery, but um, it's uh, kind of moving internally and, and gets to hundreds of millions, if not billions of records. And then S3 is starting supported an image server, um, which will be pretty cool to see where, you know, kind of seamlessly import into there. Um, and yeah, I often talk about COGS. Uh, and the benefits of that, but the cool thing with Stack is Stack's completely independent from that. So Stack, you can easily refer to the MRFs or whatever data format um, that, that works. They're kind of like peanut butter and jelly work well together, but they're also not tied to one another. Um, so we'll likely see some more Stack MRF catalogs. Um, so uh, future of Stack, what's coming next? Um, uh, we got a point cloud extension, but we don't have any data in point cloud. Uh, 
there's people been starting to work on this. This USGS data set is on um, AWS. Uh, but yeah, thinking about doing cool visualizations like this, this is in twine with a sort of cloud native point cloud format, um, but getting stack wrapped around that uh, is the intent they even made. The stack extension just haven't translated all the data yet. Um, radar sat, uh, there's some people working on getting that um, into uh, a nice stack catalog and hopefully be open and CMR search, I'm pretty sure they said this is all public, um, are gonna start to support stack as well, which uh, will be super great to see. Um, and then some random musings at the end, uh, ARD and stack. Um, so, uh, you know, I think stack and cogs are, should be an ideal format to, to help distribute ARD. Um, you know, it's kind of, ARD is really the content, so stack's pretty neutral on what you have in that. Um, it could maybe be an ARD extension at stack. It also might just be a set of other extensions that play together. I think it kind of depends what those ARD standards look like, but certainly we want to help distribute that data and make it available. Um, and yeah, the way I kind of always start extensions in stack is first make the catalog and then kind of figure out what is the extension. So it'd be cool to start to think about some reference catalogs where you know we take a subset of data, um, harmonize it all, co-register it all, and then wrap it in a stack catalog. Um, uh, a little bit on OGC and stack. Um, so we've always sought to align, I'll get a lot of questions about this, but uh, we've always sought to align stack with uh, WFS3, which is now called OGC API features, which is part of this general trend that is super exciting. Basically a lot of those principles I put at the beginning, uh, you know, two years ago when we started stack, felt very different from OGC and OGC is starting to feel a lot more like those, about those small pieces, those building blocks. Um, they did a great sprint uh, in London, uh, where they're making a lot of progress on this stuff. So uh, our draft, or our 0.8, will mostly harmonize with their draft two for core, and then we're gonna do um, more dialogues on a sprint um, and a call soon, uh, kind of focused on query. But our intent is to really merge those efforts, especially on the API front, and hopefully even contribute stack into OGC eventually. Um, uh, implementation goals, I mean, all the things get stack into everything is really my goal. Um, you know, all geospatial software, all satellite imagery available in catalogs, and diverse libraries to make it easy to build. Um, the spec, uh, you know, I think there's actually not a whole ton ton there to do. Um, people have talked about this a lot. Provenance, I'm actually hadn't spent so much on my radar, but that idea of um, the e error propagation, I think would be interesting. How can we represent that in stack? Um, but to me, that's kind of the only big major thing and doesn't necessarily have to be before 1.0. And then kind of extensions for vendors to easily put in. Um, but the goal is really stay small, you know, not try to take over everything, but how do we influence other specifications while retaining this small little piece that people can use. Um, so kind of path to 1.0. Um, Pretty sure we're gonna separate the core content from the API spec. Um, we have these kind of JSON uh, structures in item catalog and collection, then API feels a bit differently. Have that API really be aligned with WFS. And that core has really started to stabilize in the last bit. Like it's, it's changing at the edges and not in the core. Um, so hopefully get to 1.0 beta sometime this winter. And then 1.0 when extensions are mature and we have more implementations. Um, and a year ago, I actually put this challenge of a billion unique stack records online, but I sort of realized that it was a little ambiguous. Oh, I forgot, I meant to change that one. Uh, a billion, not a million. A um, million is quite easy. Um, but then talking to <laughs> vendors, people are already have internal catalogs that are a billion stack records. I was like, ah, that wasn't good enough. Um, so I think it's really publicly available stack records, which CMR is going to take us a long way there. Uh, you know, Planet should sometime uh, take us a big chunk of the way there. Um, but that's kind of the new goal is get uh, publicly available and it is really seeming like internal use is going to be far, far bigger, which is awesome to see. Um, so yeah, that's the new goal. But yeah, overall, um, thank you. Stack's going pretty awesome as you can see. Um, and if you want to learn more, go to stackspec.org. Thank you.
All right, so kind of to take you a little bit more into the weeds, I'm Renee Pischke, I work out at USGS Eros, and I'm going to talk to you today, at least try and communicate to you the changes that are going to be coming with the collection to metadata and a little bit on our flow with the lens or with the cog and the stack record creation and how we're doing that in AWS. So an overview of this, we're going to be talking about the background on the Landsat metadata updates, the collection to metadata structure, uh, Landsat in the cloud, and mapping the MTL records to stack, generate the stack records. So a background on the metadata updates. Um, it, we had a multi-mission effort to make the product level metadata more uniform across the different Landsat satellites. So, you know, there's a different number of bands with each satellite, uh, different unique qualities to those satellites and sensors. So we crosswalked all that metadata into a giant spreadsheet and checked against discrepancies. And so ahead of collection two processing, we wanted to also incorporate the higher levels of metadata into that MTL record. So if you look at the ARD tile as it is today, you've got the level one MTL record that is in with the product as well as a level two XML record which does not really follow any of the structure. So what we're doing is really unifying that, bringing it back, creating the, the uh, MTL record for the level one and the level two, putting it together in one record so you don't have to download the level one product just to get your metadata relating to the level um, two product. So our product metadata format, um, it will still be in that MTL, which uses the object description language, but it will also translate it into an XML format, which scientists seem to like. Um, we discussed a JSON format, but it was not implemented on present premises at this time. Um, but as a necess necessity in generating a stack record, we do a direct JSON transformation out of the MTL in order to generate the um, stack record. So a little bit of our crosswalk highlights. As you can see here, this is looking at the MSS, TM, and ETM, and only tiers sensors. And kind of, this is just the top part of it, but we went through the entire uh, record collection to do that. Um, these are some sample MTLs. Of course, you can't really fit them all on one screen, but the first one, you know, is relatively small. And then for the collection two, you see that we've appended that level one metadata to the bottom of the record. So the newer record will all already be on the top. So a little bit of a walkthrough. I don't want to touch on everything, but this has all of the, the information that you would need to actually map into a stack record. You've got the, uh, we're, we're adding the digital object identifier for research purposes. So you can actually uh, reference your data in your papers now get to the exact page that will give you the specs on the details of how things were processed. You got the Landsat product ID, which has an uh, identifier that calls it out as a level two science product instead of uh, the level one GTTP processing that you would normally, normally seen. And of course, every file name that goes into that piece is, is listed here. And that was the product contents. And we go into a new section called image attributes. That's going to be more straightforward with what the original MTL looked like. So that's going to have your uh, path and row, your target path and row if it's off nader, um, your cloud cover scores. We have one for regular and land, which doesn't change from the first product. You've got some projection attributes, so it'll have your UTM zone in there as well as your uh, product coordinates. And then you come to the level two processing record. And so this is going to have another digital object identifier that will be distinct for the collection two records. And Then we go into some additional information. We've got the surface temperature parameters, the surface, um, those were their surface reflectance parameters. And 
down here you have the Landsat scene ID. So that's important to note that we're still carrying the scene ID along with every product that is generated after the level one product. So therefore, if a level two product was generated off of the same acquisition, then you still can maintain the provenance through the records. And the sample metadata is available on the Landsat Missions website. You'll notice that the uh, URLs to get to the Landsat Mission website have changed to be more included underneath the land resources section of the website. The fastest way to get there, if you go through Google or through Bing, if you just type in Landsat Collection into, that will be your first result, and you can get those metadata files there. So with Landsat in the cloud, our collection to the bulk of our processing will be in the cloud. And we're using the AWS tools and services, including Batch, Lambda, and more. Forward processing will occur on premises and then be transferred to the cloud, or to the cloud, where, cloud where it will be unpackaged and turned into a cloud-optimized geotiff and the, with the space CO temporal asset catalog metadata. Uh, there are plans to move our functionality into step functions when that becomes available in cloud hosting solutions. So what we are going to be doing is submitting a batch job to generate the format and then spit that out into the Landsat or USGS Landsat bucket, which will be where the product lives. So the stack records will live right alongside the rest of the data. Mapping MTLs into the stack record. So we're going to be using uh, Lambda functions for that and we need to build different workflows based on the different um, sensors and the different levels of products. Uh, then they will be imported into Elasticsearch to enable fast re response and API development. So for a crosswalk of the MTL to stack records, we did add a few additional fields on top of the ones that are available in the Planet PDS bucket because we, we took what was available on the additional criteria tab in Earth Explorer and expanded that to some of the more common things that people would want to be searching. So things like uh, sun elevation, sun azimuth, um, satellite, uh, WRS path, row and type, um, and then a day-night indicator. So we'll be putting collection one, level one records up, which do include nighttime acquisitions, which is something that wasn't called out originally in, in the stack record. We do have some open issues with the stack records which is um, trying to get the data corners instead of the product corners, finding a good source for that because it's not in any of our databases on premises and it is not in the MTL record. So we have the image extent corners, not the part where the data actually begins. So data corners are difficult to extract or estimate based on satellite drift and framing issues and it's an ongoing sy issue with the legacy systems for geometric accuracy. So when you're putting out down a point in Earth Explorer, you might end up with a scene that has black fill where you want you to actually have pixels. Um, so um, another thing is mapping the provisional level two XML into, and the level one MTL at the same time into a stack record. So that has caused some confusion and frustration on the point of our developers. Otherwise, um, we do have some issue with projections. We do have a level to Albers product as well as the UTM projection and a polar stereographic projection when we get toward the poles. And at any time, if you have any questions, you can contact us at user services. Um, it's cussserve at usgs.gov if you want to be part of the Eros user group. We do have a, a small community of users that are um, there for us to kind of bounce ideas off of, get them added to whitelists, get them interacting with the data sooner so that we can get some feedback and generate that into some more development and updates that would happen in our products. That's it. Matt. Yeah. No, it's Matt. Yes, it's J. 
just downloading. Okay, got it. Unfortunately. Or you can give your thing to me. Hello. Okay. Hi there, my name is Matt Hansen. I work for a company called Element 84. I've been involved with the stack work uh, since it started after uh, the state of the map in Boulder. Uh, it was the first one before we knew it was called stack. I don't know, what, what would we call it back then? Just some, we needed to do something about metadata. Like cloud data interoperability. Yeah. Uh, so it was great that uh, Chris could give an overview and the benefits of it so I don't have to go through all that stuff. Um, I'm just going to try and go into details. I actually have a ton of slides here, but I think I'll, I'll probably end up skipping over some of them that he did, he did end up cover, covering. Um, I will give my take on what it is. Uh, so I, I explain Stack as three different things. One of it is a metadata standard, a metadata model to describe these fields. As Chris had said, like cloud cover, like what, what does that look like? Is it cloud cover with an underscore? Is it cloud coverage? Is it, you know, what is it? So we wanted to make sure that there was a, a set of standard metadata so that when people search on things that they are searching for consistent fields across multiple sensors uh, with a focus on search and discovery. If it's not something that you're going to search for, maybe it doesn't belong in stack. Um, the second thing that it is, is it's a, it's a specification for how to link a bunch of files together in catalogs. And this is really important, the cool GIF that he showed with being able to put in an ID into Google. The idea is that if your data isn't searchable, it isn't crawlable by a search engine, then it might as well not exist. Um, the catalogs need to be surfaced so that they can be indexed, not necessarily just by Google, but by some sort of crawler that's going to go and put all of that information in Elasticsearch or in a database so that it can then be easily discovered. Uh, the third thing that it is is a specification for a dynamic API and where you can search on any arbitrary fields. And here it, it's cool because we're leveraging WFS3, or I guess it's a new name now, stat, what is it, OGC API feature? Okay, so it's not a replacement for all these other things. Now, Chris had said that, but I just wanna iterate that. Stack is not a replacement for existing metadata for data providers. It is to be surfaced, to be simple, to be, dare I say, human readable to some extent. You want users to be able to look at this data and be able to make sense of it, especially at the collection and catalog level. I think that's pretty important. Um, so this isn't gonna be something that somebody's gonna adopt. Uh, some small sat provider is gonna launch satellites and use Stack as their source of metadata. There's a whole bunch of things that it's not gonna include. And I say that in a year from now, somebody's gonna probably do that. Right? Um, so there's three main entities in Stack. There's catalogs, there's collections, and there's items. Uh, I'm going to go through each one of them. So catalogs are simply containers for collections or for items. Uh, these are the fields that you'd find in a, in a catalog. There's not a whole lot there. Most of them are required except for a title. I suggest that you give it a title as well. Uh, and it's really just linking to other things. Now here's an important concept in Stack, is the links. Make judicious use of links. Um, links can be anything. They could link to documentation. They could link to a landing page. There could be an about page. Any normal relationship, any rel type would, would be supported. You want a um, link to software that is related or a scientific paper that this perhaps is all based on. Um, links are a critical feature of Stack uh, because we want to be able to link to all of the other important things that 
users of the catalog may want to access. That being said, back to the crawlable static catalogs, is we have some hierarchical links. So these are required in a static catalog where a catalog is going to have different types of links that point to children. Those children will point back to their parents. They'll point to the root catalog that all this falls under. And ultimately, down at the lowest level, collections or catalogs are going to point to items. And items are the actual data. Collections. You'll see that there's some fields in there that are the same as catalogs. In fact, all of the catalog fields are in the collection, and that's because collections are stack catalogs as well. They're catalogs because they can contain other catalogs, they can contain other things that they link to. Um, but what they really are is a collection of some sort of unified set of items. Um, we might call them scenes. Um, but they're related in some way. Landsat 8, level 1 might be a collection. But you can define the collections however you want. And this is also a critical point to underscore, is that as a data provider, you can define your collections however you want. Maybe you have some disaster data for a particular region, and it actually is combined from a whole bunch of different sensors, including drone data. Maybe that's a collection. The collection concept is flexible enough to be able to do that. Uh, the important things to point out here are the extent, which describes the overall extent, spatial, spatial and temporal extent, of all of the items that fall under that collection, uh, and also properties. So properties takes some, um, deserves a little bit of an explanation, because collections don't necessarily have any properties on their own. But the items that fall under a collection might have properties that are common across all of the items. Landsat 8, if that's a collection, the instrument is the same amongst all the items in the collection. So what we do is we move that metadata to the collection level. And now we don't have to redefine it in all of the items and duplicate that. Uh, for things such as instrument or platform, that's a small amount of data, so maybe not such a big deal. But we also want to describe BAM information uh, and the wavelengths, the uh, center wavelength and the, um, and, the, and, the, and the width of that band. And so it's useful to put that into the collection. Also, you'll see that it has links, of course, uh, just like the catalogs do. Um, it, the other fields I'm not going to go into, but like providers and license, these are important fields because it, it tells you where the data came from and, and the, the license for using it, uh, but you, you, can, you can look up more information about that. Uh, now, item fields. So this is a core stack item. There really isn't a whole lot here. This is a GeoJSON feature is what it is. There's an ID. Um, there's the type, which is feature, because that's defined by GeoJSON. Uh, there's a geometry and a bounding box. Again, that's GeoJSON. There's properties, which GeoJSON defines, except it doesn't define anything specifically in the properties. Uh, but then we also have links. Now, that's not part of GeoJSON, but you can add whatever top-level fields you want. Uh, so we have links, and we have assets, and we have a single string field called collection, which is the collection ID that this item belongs to, if it belongs to a collection. We then go into the item properties. And again, a core stack item has these properties. The most important one here is the date time and no, really the date time because the license and the providers really could, that might come from the collection because it might be all the same between all of them. Um, the assets, that other top level field that I had referred to, this is perhaps of most interest to actual users because this is the data. We have a URL to the data, and we have a media type for it. So this is going to describe whether or not this is a PNG or a metadata file or a cloud-optimized geotiff. OK, now that we uh, have those concepts in place, you can see uh, going through a catalog here. This is a top-level catalog. Go down to a collection. You see there's the extent there. Uh, we have providers. Here we have a bunch of common properties. This is a Landsat 8 level 1 collection. So we have these common properties that are common amongst all of them. And then we have assets, which there's no URLs given there, but it does give 
information about the type and what type of assets might be expected. And then you see there's links. So these are all the child links that go to another catalog and this is just gonna go through. This is a static catalog, so that's why I'm just typing in the actual um, URL in the top to, to drill down into that. So these are just simply standalone JSON files. Okay, so now extensions. You probably notice there's a whole lot of information in those items that feels like it should be there, but it isn't of particular interest to ARD or satellite imagery providers. Um, and that comes through content extensions. So content extensions are, we define a couple different types of extensions. There's API extensions, which I'm not going to talk about because I'm not going to talk really at all about the API. Um, and then there's content extensions. And what content extensions do is add fields, they add properties to the item or the collection or the catalog. They could add additional fields to any of these things. But so far, um, I think all the extensions are really just at the item. Oh, the top one actually does say catalog or collection. I am going to talk about three of these extensions that are most pertinent here. Um, the EO extension, which stands for electro-optical, not Earth observation, although I suppose it could. Uh, SAR, which you wonder why isn't that also part of the EO extension. Let's not talk about that. Uh, and the label extension. Uh, the scientific extension is probably, uh, the rest of these extensions actually only add a few, a hand, small handful of fields. Like the date time range is actually, I think, a pretty important extension. It just defines a start time and an end time because any image capture, right, is not going to have a single date time. It's going to have a beginning time and an end time. But we might also have mosaics in our catalog, in which case we want a start time and an end time. Um, the scientific extension uh, allows you to use um, uh, allows you to represent DOI, give the DOI of, um, uh, for scientific papers and, and stuff like that. Uh, so those might also be of interest for sure. So the EO extension defines all of these things that are particular to satellites. We have our grand sample distance. Uh, we have our platform constellation and instrument. Now, those three are all somewhat similar, but platform is the actual physical platform that this, it's the satellite. It's the satellite that this instrument is flying on. Whereas the instrument is the actual instrument. So MODIS is the instrument, Aqua or Terra is the platform. Um, Landsat is the platform, not the instrument. OLI Tears is the instrument or two instruments. Um, the constellation is something like if you have doves or you have Sentinel-2 is a constellation. There's multiple platforms and instruments within the constellation. We also describe the bands, which I'll have another slide for in a second. Uh, the EPSG code, if there's no EPSG code, if it's non-projected data, that's fine. You just wouldn't fill this in. Cloud cover, perhaps one of the most useful and sought after field when you're searching for data. Uh, we also have an off nadir angle for Landsat, which I use in most of the examples. Of course, that's zero because this is the scene center uh, off nadir viewing angle, which um, for a non-task satellite is zero. Uh, and then we have some geometries, uh, additional geometries, the azimuth, uh, which I'm not completely convinced that people actually would search on. Uh, and then the sun angles. Again, I don't, sun elevation might be a useful thing to search on. So now the EO band object. So this is a property within the item, although you might move it to the collection, remember, because we, we can move these things to the collection. The band object describes the wavelength information about the band, the ground sample distance, because each one of your bands might actually have a, a different resolution than that top level. If you notice before, one of the properties was GSD. So how is there a GSD there? And there's also a GSD under bands. Well, the bands can be separate. At the top level, we define that as the best resolution available for the scene. Because as a user, you might want to search for, you just want to search generally for the resolution of data sets and not get into, well, I want the resolution for the red band to be this. Uh, and so it's important to describe that at the top level, but then also have additional qualifiers for each of these bands. 
Uh, the accuracy, this touches upon the uncertainty that we have talked about before, although I've never populated this in any of the catalogs that I've created because I don't know what that number is. Uh, and then the center wavelength and the full width half maximum, um, in, all in microns. So, oh, and then the other thing is common name. This is the most important thing, I think, uh, is the common name. So this allows us to describe a band with a common name. I, as a user, I actually, I, I don't want to have to search for assets that are at a certain, you know, at 650 nanometers. Um, I just want to say red. So by giving this information to all the bands, then we have a sensor agnostic way to find out which bands were of interest where we don't have to remember this dumb table, which no doubt everybody had to look this up and probably has to look it up every single time that they want to do this, right? If you're working with a lot of sensors, it's like, oh, what, it, you know, what band numbers are these again? And then you got to go back to Landsat 5 and then, you know, you get them all mixed up. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. So SWEAR 1.6 and SWEAR 2.2, I should just explain uh, the reason for those numbers is because like, so I had, I used this naming convention a while ago to do something similar. And it was always SWEAR 1, SWEAR 2, just like in numeric order, um, which dro drove me crazy because like the numbers didn't represent anything. So SWEAR 1.6 represents the band at 1.6 microns because when you have, you're, you're generally going to have two shortwave bands. One of them is going to be at 1.6, the other one's going to be at 2.2. This is probably open to refinement because we now actually we are generally getting like often two bands at around 2.2. Two, around 2 .2. Um, and then the long wave is even actually a little bit more complicated. You can't just simply combine this to, you can't simply just put this down to 11 and 12 microns. But uh, I, I like Peter's uh, actually table that had all the different colors. I saw orange in there and violet. That's great. We should definitely look into using that. So. All right, now we have this band information. We have the assets. How do we link the assets to the band? How do we know what bands are in these assets? And the way that we do that is in the asset information off there to the right, okay, you'll see down at B1, the URLs have been taken out of here just to like keep this short here. Um, you'll see this says EO bands zero. So that says that that asset has those bands in it, and that's the index of this array. Um, Landsat, it looks like there's a lot of redundant information here because we have the files separated by bands and then the bands and they all have the same ID, but I think you get the idea. For each asset, you list the bands as an array that you can use to reference the, the bands array. Uh, the SAR extension is quite a bit more complicated. There's a lot more fields in it because SAR is like complicated anyway. Like, I don't know, like a lot of these variables, like I'm not convinced that people actually search on these, but then they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, no, that's super useful. <laughs> okay, so these are half of the properties here. Again, we see, we see a lot of duplication between the EO uh, extension and this one. We've, we've, we have constellation instrument, right, uh, platform, um, we have bands, SAR bands, rather than EO bands. That works exactly the same way. There is some work to be done, I think, in harmonizing these and, and taking common properties out and maybe making another extension. Those are things that are actually ongoing. So that maybe down the line we won't have this situation where we've got a lot of, a lot of fields that are pretty much the same thing through multiple extensions. Uh, and then the second extension, uh, this is the, sec the second set of the extensions where there's a whole lot more um, bewildering SAR extension fields. We also have uh, common names, just like for EO bands. Um, just a single letter designation, because that's descriptive. Okay, so label extension. This, uh, this is, I, I, this keeps on coming up, right? ML analysis ready uh, training data and all this. Uh, so there is a label extension. And label extension, it used to be called the training data extension when we, we first created it because the idea was that this was a input into a training data workflow, uh, machine ML workflow. However, 
when we, like at the last stack sprint, we were talking about it, we we're like, well, wait a second. This could also be the output of an ML workflow, right? It's, which could then be the input to another ML workflow and so on, right? Uh, and so the label extension um, made, just made better sense. So the label extension covers all of these different things. We're talking classification, regression, uh, object detection, and segmentation. The idea was to encompass all of these things. And in the label extension, we have assets, the assets. So an item, a, a label stack item is a set of training data geometries. And then also links to the source imagery that those came from. Um, it doesn't say that here, but I think the, inten the intention was that the, yeah, the, the source is the stack record of the source imagery. Um, but since what happens is when you're creating this labeled data, oftentimes you'll take that source imagery and render it in some way, because maybe these are being hand drawn, most likely. Uh, we also have the rendered raster imagery, which is pretty important, because that you might want to display that underneath your, your, uh, your labels. So the label extension adds additional properties to the items. Uh, which just help navigate through the, the, the assets which provide the labels, because that, that asset that de defines the labels doesn't have to just be a GeoJSON feature uh, collection. It could be a raster image could provide your labels. And so this, uh, this accounts for that and allows for that as well. We can uh, specify what our classes are so that you can easily search through a catalog of different labels. And you could say, you know, which... Um, which, which label uh, training data sets have cars in them? And you could, you could find those. <clears throat> I just want to now go over the stack ecosystem. Uh, so this is uh, the software, the open source ecosystem that has sort of arisen out of the stack work. How much time do I got? Five minutes? All right, I can do that. So Stack Validator, Chris talked about that. I don't need to talk about that. All right, Stack Browser. Chris talked about that. All right, this is great. QGIS Plugin. Chris talked about that as well. Okay, so I'll skip to Sat Utils. Uh, Sat Utils was a, um, actually, a project that Al Ariza and I worked on Sat Utils when we were at Development Seed. And it has now grown, it has now grown since then and is now has kind of really become a repository and a GitHub organization for a bunch of really stack-related tools. Everything there pretty much is, is, is for stack purposes now, uh, even if it originally wasn't. Um, one of the most commonly cited ones is SAT API. So this is a uh, dynamic API. So it's essentially a reference implementation. It really, at, at this point, it's, real, it's the only true reference implementation, I think. Some of, the other, some of the other APIs are, are not quite a, a true re reference implementation. It's a node library. It's easily deployable to AWS on your own uh, AWS account. And it does two cool things. One is that you can point it to any piece of a catalog, any file within a stack catalog, a crawlable one, and it will crawl the whole thing and ingest all that data into Elasticsearch. The other thing is that it can subscribe to SNS topics, and which contain a stack message, and it'll keep your catalog up to date. Um, and yeah, it's a cool animated GIF. Uh, you, you can look at all the cool animated GIFs in the link later. Uh, SAT Stack is a Python library, which is used for creating or working with stack catalogs. If you want to use stack and you're using Python, check this out. Especially see the Jupyter Notebook tutorials, which are actually a pretty decent tutorial to stack in general, uh, I, I think, uh, from a Python standpoint. Uh, so look at that. It was used to create some existing catalogs, including the Landsat, Sentinel, and Sibers uh, catalogs. Uh, those are links to the Stack browser that points to those static catalogs. Uh, Sat Stack Landsat uh, is a repository that's really of no use to anybody right now. Um, I used it to create the existing Landsat catalog, uh, and it transforms that MTL data to Stack. Uh, and for um, L1C. 
And it also, there's a deployed Lambda function, and what it does is it uh, listens for new scenes, which is another SNS topic. Um, and when new Landsat scenes are deposited on AWS, it converts those and uh, publishes another SNS message. So you can use SAT API to subscribe to that, and that's what we do. Uh, SAT stack Sentinel is the same thing, except for Sentinel. Um, it uses the tile info.json file to create the stack. Uh, SAT search. Perhaps the most useful utility uh, for uh, anybody using stack that isn't, that is more interested in searching rather than like standing up their own API. This is a Python library, but it's also a command line tool. It allows you to search any stack compliant endpoint, save those results, and uh, load those up later. You can specify specific band colors to download. You can say, oh, I want to download red and near IR. It's very lightweight. There, it does no geospatial processing. GDAL is not required. The only thing that's required is the requests library. Um, and so here, uh, I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but this is, this is worth looking at, uh, is that you can, you can do this calendar printing. Say, so isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, you know, hey, if you're, a, you know, if you like to use uh, command line tools, you know, this is great. Um, it's, a, it's a quick way to just give it an AOI, give it a date range, give it a cloud cover, whatever, whatever you want to filter, and just say, uh, you know, what's available, what do I have available visually? Um, you know, if you want anything more complicated than that, then, you know, of course, a, a, a user, a true UI would be great. But, you know, this is, this is good for just... And here it's saving, um, saving the results as a JSON file in the end. So SAT fetch uh, works just like SAT search, only it does use GDAL. There's a Docker image to do it. Um, and this adds a feature to SAT search that rather than just downloading the original file, you, it, will download, it will fetch just the AOI um, that you give it. And so here we have Ngoro Ngoro Crater. This is a Sentinel footprint. There's a Landsat footprint. And uh, here we use SAT search. We find 18 scenes. All right, keep in mind Landsat 8. These are, uh, if you're going to download the original data files of these, these are one gigabyte a piece. So that's 18 gigabytes that you would have to download. But we were just interested in that small little section. And uh, 59 seconds, we went and fetched the 18 scenes uh, for Ngoro Goro Crater. Now, the reason why, of course, these are co cogs, except they're not, co they're not quite cogs, but um, these, this is the AWS Landsat public data set. Uh, and then we do the same thing for Sentinel, uh, which takes a lot longer because of JPEG 2000. And also, don't do this. It's a requester pays bucket. You won't be happy. And, I, I want, the reason why I like to show these two is because we have now just used the same command, the same procedure to go and fetch a region of imagery for a time series across two different sensors that originally had completely different metadata. So that's the point I wanted to get across. Is this, this right here, this is the power of stack. Uh, SAT API browser is essentially a UI SAT search. Uh, Chris showed the um, the user interface, and this is something that Development Seed just recently uh, open sourced. Um, one thing that has not been mentioned at all, another thing that we're working on, is uh, Peter mentioned Pangeo. Pangeo is a really cool community of scientists, and for that work, uh, we're working on Intake Stack. Intake is a data loader uh, that allows you to um, essentially take, take the assets from these stack items and then turn them into DASC arrays so that you can process this in a Jupyter Notebook really fast and uh, cool. It's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, Earth search. So you're all familiar with the AWS public data sets. Chris did say that um, this was going to index all of the AWS public data sets. That was a lie. Sorry. <laughs> all right, it wasn't. OK, yeah, all right. It, well, not even, um, but it's getting there. Um, all right, it wasn't a lie. It was, it was not entirely true. Uh, but that, yes, that's the goal. The goal is to, any, for anything that there is a stack catalog for, um, it will be surfaced at this endpoint, Earth Search, which you could use SAT Search with. Uh, this is just an instance of SAT API uh, that is uh, indexing um, 
existing catalogs. I'm currently working on a Sentinel-1 catalog and updated catalogs for Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 for the latest version of Stack. Uh, and we also have an, a NAEP catalog that somebody else has been working on that we haven't ingested yet. Uh, stack challenges, I can skip those because I know I'm over my time. Uh, how can you be part of this? Oh yeah, use Stack. Cool, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> now for something completely different. Um, all right, so this is a, a short talk uh, that I actually just gave last week, uh, but Ignacio asked me to repeat it here today. Um, uh, this is on the IEEE P401 standard. Uh, the, this is the new hyperspectral standard, uh, standard that started in 2018, and so we recently gave a progress update as part of a uh, standardization track at the IGARS conference uh, talking about uh, the GRSS. Uh, Keely talked about that. Um, also technical uh, industry education events as well and uh, had some meetings there to uh, update uh, everybody what's going on with SAR, um, uh, microwave, and hyperspectral uh, as well as other standards that are coming out the GRSS is trying to contain. So um, we're going to talk about the focus uh, of what this standard is, uh, what it is not, uh, why it's needed, and uh, what we're doing, and then how you can participate. Um, we're, this is basically centered around uh, the idea that uh, we're going to work with push broom imagers first because they're probably the most mature technology that's out there, uh, the one that seems to have the best uh, regime for calibration and validation, uh, as well as being the ones that are uh, making the most progress in the market and sort of really creating the market. There's lots of other architectures out there. Uh, we're not excluding architectures, but we figured uh, there's a big task, as you will see coming up, uh, what, in what we have to do and try to standardize. Um, it's kind of surprising to some people to find that you know with the, the abundance of hyperspectral that you can see out there, data and, and just uh, seeing people's uses of it and so forth, that there really isn't a standard for it at all. <laughs> um, it, it, and uh, that's kind of shocked me. This actually, this effort started in 2014 when NIST got up, had a, had a workshop uh, like this one at the end of an SPIE, con SPIE conference and said, uh, we need a hyperspectral standard. There were 200 people in the room, everybody said, yeah and nothing happened for two years. <laughs> so uh, I kind of informally just started taking names because uh, I thought it was a good idea and then uh, the opportunity presented itself and IEEE, IEEE said go. So uh, uh, that's how you find yourself the head of a standard. Um, so um, we are um, trying to also establish a standard for some other interesting technology, especially uh, snapshot imagers. Uh, push broom is, is, is uh, cool, but it's relatively expensive. It's uh, limited on how small you can make it. Um, snapshot imagers, you know, are already going into things like cell phones and things like that. Uh, so that'll be coming along quickly behind that, and we're working with some other standards groups. Um, so I'll, I'll just put the, the quick plug in with where we are right now. Uh, the officers, uh, myself, uh, David Allen at NIST, um, John Gilchrist is the secretary. Um, we had a meeting last week in IGARS. Uh, our next one is in August, and uh, it's very easy to join. Just send me an email, uh, and then you will regret that because uh, this is a very active group. We have a lot of meetings. You will get a lot of emails from Chris Durrell, unfortunately. I apologize for that up front. Um, we do have 250 participants in this group. It is a huge group. Um, this is a herding the cats exercise. Um, uh, but we do have, and we do have 50 very uh, passionate contributing members, and so that uh, that enabled us to break it into some subgroups to try to to try to keep things moving forward. Um, so why do we need a hyperspectral imaging standard now? Um, 
This is a report from a, a market study. Um, whether you believe these things or not, that's another question. But um, essentially, we're looking at a market that's growing at 15% per year. There's a lot of applications. Um, I personally see a lot of data from hyperspectral out there, but it's not a lot of good data because uh, the instruments aren't well characterized. Uh, they're over-marketed, um, and uh, that creates a lot of um, potential disappointment with customers of these types of products. So if this industry is going to continue to grow uh, without uh, sort of imploding on, um, on uh, uh, mis misread expectations on what the instruments will do, then we really need to kind of pull that together and get some degree of um, control on the uh, unmet, unmet expectations. And a big part of that is having tested and verified performance uh, that will engender uh, consumer confidence um, and then matching the instrument capabilities to the applications. That's, that's really what it's all about. At the end of the day, we can create nice standards around testing and validation and all this other thing, but if it doesn't actually apply to what the end user is actually trying to do, you won't get what you want. Um, and that's, so we ha constantly have to keep reminding people in the group who are all engineers and instrument manufacturers and data people, um, it's about the user. It's about the user. We need to make this simple, accessible, and usable. Um, so the tests are practical. Uh, we, we need to, do, well, one of the first things you need to do, and I've, I've heard a lot of that in this group already today, uh, some really good resources from some of the other speakers. Uh, you do need a language for this. Uh, when I say bandwidth, what do I mean? When I say GSD, is that constant over a hyperspectral instrument? It's not. Um, so you know, uh, how do we define these things? How do, we, uh, how do we measure these things? Uh, those two things have to be very consistent with each other. So that's a big challenge to try to get that dictionary and library of tests put together. Uh, the tests have to be practical. And he's, it's wonderful if we all had glamour instruments from NASA at $2 million a piece with four PhDs running it all the time. But really, we're talking about practical, uh, I'm talking about light bulbs and targets and other types of things where you can run basic tests to tell you or not whether or not your instrument's actually performing the way it should and whether it's going to perform the task. Um, so with that is also th uh, three different levels of uh, terminology, uh, sorry, uh, specification, a basic level of specification that uh, a standard uh, non-educated user can, can uh, understand at least something about what that instrument can do. Uh, a more advanced level, and then an engineering level, which really gets into the, the full details of what, what test was run and, how, and the, the uh, produced data from that test. So, um, and then finally, uh, and most likely most importantly, although uh, to me sort of the biggest and, and least well-defined uh, task, but one that you're all struggling with in analysis-ready data is how to create and translate data uh, for this, uh, for this uh, all these different instrument types and all these different uh, data sets and all these different applications. Um, that's, a, that's a really big task uh, and the one that's most uh, probably relevant to this group. Um, so push, I said this before, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, push remark textures are pretty radiometrically reliable uh, if you calibrate them well. Um, they're, uh, you, you get huge data sets out of these things. I know that uh, we're talking about lots of data out of, out of satellites uh, that are multispectral. Well, add a couple hundred bands to that, and you're going to be uh, having all sorts of problems getting the data out of the instrument, as well as getting the data down, getting the data, and then just handling the data. But there's good and powerful computers and good algorithms being developed uh, more and more every day um, that uh, make that easier to use. Um, and there's a there's almost um, a whole other standard that needs to be developed on the applications alone. So once you understand what your instrument can do, then you want to apply it to something. Um, that might actually wind up being another subgroup or another effort uh, down the road here. Um, and it's one that constantly seeks to divert us from our main task, which is actually defining a standard for push broom. Uh, people want to get into applications, and I get that, but uh, we got to keep it focused. Um, so um, there's uh, also next generation hyperspectrometers, which are more compact faster, lower cost, uh, have onboard processing, all sorts of fun things that are starting to come out. Uh, but again, they got to have a good baseline. And then uh, snapshot and UAVs. And um, the, the, the fear is that the market may stall if we don't actually get some sort of a baseline on this because people are just get too frustrated that they can't actually make any sense of their data or they can't send it to anybody else and they can't make any sense of their data. So we got to fix that. Um, 
There are other groups that have reached out as soon as this smart group was created, uh, EMVA 1288, uh, which is a really good machine vision standard uh, for the European um, um, Machine Vision Association. Uh, if you haven't used it, use it. It's a really good standard, uh, really solid work from this group. They're extending to INGAS uh, next year if anybody's interested in that level of, uh, of um, um, effort and joining that group. Uh, the TC211, we have several liaisons uh, into the ISO groups, um, and they've, they're lending us assist assistance, and there's a lot of cross interplay. We are not inventing. We are borrowing, cataloging, and, and reusing. <laughs> Um, we, we will be inventing some things, but, but for the most part, if it exists, we want to catalog it and reuse it. And that, so that also extends to UFARS, JC, ASPRS, uh, and even NGA uh, has also reached out to us. So, and then DIN is also starting a standard in Germany. Um, easy enough, send me an email, you'll regret it. Um, subgroup progress, uh, where are we? Um, so we have three subgroups, we have terminology, which is the T1 characterization, C1, and data structures. Um, all the subgroups report into the main meeting um, as to their progress, and each subgroup has about 10 to 20 active members um, who are contributing. Um, and that's a, that's a good size. Um, we've got a lot of passionate people here. Uh, C1 is headed by Dr. Andreas Baumgartner. This is a really international coalition of people. So, and the Europeans have done a lot of really good work, so I was glad to have very strong participation from that side of the equation. Uh, but then uh, you also see a lot of instrument manufacturers. We have every hyperspectral instrument manufacturer on the planet in this group. So uh, that is uh, a challenge and a bonus because um, we get everybody's opinion. And then we have to figure out who's right. <laughs> so um, we are taking a black box approach to the characterization. Uh, we don't want to know anything about what's going on inside the instrument. In fact, we want it to be somewhat uh, agnostic to that. We want to be able to set up a set of tests and, and run them, which are based on physics, and have that instrument perform, and then uh, eventually go back and figure out what happened. But uh, be able to, the black box configuration really represents kind of the sim most simplistic form of testing that we can, we can set up. Um, there's a, f a flow chain that we've created, uh, a couple of really good papers out there that uh, preceded the group that have become kind of our foundation documents. They're out on our website, so if you want to go access those, you can. Uh, but basically, uh, this chain is everything you kind of have to characterize to get to the, to the end characterization of your instrument and what it will do. And that in, involves radiance and reflectance and wavelength and all of these other uh, different types of uh, parameters that you have to measure. Uh, eye chart, sorry. Uh, this is what we're working on in C1. Uh, every single one of these is a topic that we're working on and developing a test for and will be documented and have uh, corresponding definitions in the terminology group. Uh, it's an immense task. We have a four-year charter to try to accomplish this. We're a year and a half into it, but um, I'll show you what we're coming out with so far. Um, stray light, uh, sorry, we'll go back. Spectral performance, geometric, radiometric, stray light, uh, and other physical specifications pertaining to the instrument's uh, power, weight, size, uh, capability, et cetera. Um, so just to show you what's going on, uh, definitions of point spread functions and spatial spectral, uh, how do we actually calculate it? How do we measure it? How do we represent it? Uh, some interesting graphs. Some, uh, a lot of people assume point spread function is constant. Um, it's not. Uh, point spread function is, is a function of the dispersion in the instrument, as well as uh, some other things going on physically with the, the instrument, like lenses and so forth. So uh, you really have to measure it. And you can really see this is two different instruments. The top row is one instrument. The top row is a bottom instrument. They're both specified the same. <laughs> which one would you buy? <laughs> uh, if you know what you're looking at in that chart, you would buy the top one. <laughs> um, but another way to do that, for those of you not initiated to, say, an squared energy type uh, representation, is um, just basically a long, uh, a long track and uh, spatial and um, spectral, uh, you know, how well do we maintain? You know, everybody can read kind of a flat line. Ideally, you want a flat line here once, once you have a a well understood dispersion point. A lot of the instrument manufacturers measure at one point and then call it the dispersion across the entire instrument. That is not true. <laughs> um, so here is an actual representation of dispersion across an instrument where you could actually figure out uh, whether or not you have a problem for your specific signature analysis. 
Um, also, SNR is another one. These are both standards that are coming forward soon for vote. So actually, we're getting kind of to the interesting point where we're going to have some documentation that people can read through and vote on, say, I like that, I don't like that. Uh, but uh, SNR, big one. You know, everybody gives their highest SNR. Uh, that's great. Uh, not really relevant to what a lot of people are doing. <laughs> you need the low line, too. You need your lowest SNR and your highest SNR. So we're taking a, a boundary approach and a radiance-based method that we hope will, people will be able to interpret easily, even those in the uh, vaguely initiated aspect of, of hyperspectral measurement can kind of understand, this is my noise floor and this is my saturation point and the radiance that drives those two numbers. So we hope that that will be a more uh, easy way to interpret what that instrument is capable of doing. The terminology group uh, is headed by Dr. Oliver Weatherby and David Allen from NIST. Um, this is getting past English. English doesn't do a good job of representing what we say. When we need bandwidth, we actually need something that accompanies a, a, a word definition, but also accompanies the math that goes with that. Uh, so there is a lot of great work that's out there that we're cataloging. We already have a 22-page library that we, uh, is available on, uh, to the membership right now, but hopefully we'll be voting on that soon and getting that out as well. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the real challenges, uh, hyperspectral. What does hyperspectral mean? Well, uh, we actually had this debate again last week in Japan. Um, uh, these are two definitions that are coming forward. Uh, we think that there's some val uh, validity of this. We've done s um, <coughs> statistical sampling of the group to actually find kind of an inflection point of what is hyperspectral and what is not hyperspectral, but I also believe there's going to be a lot of exceptions to that. So we're going to have to be able to contain that in the standard. Um, and uh, we even got into it uh, uh, yes, uh, last week about Imaging spectroscopy versus hyperspectral. What is the, you know, hyperspectral is a subcategory of imaging spectroscopy. I will, and imaging spectroscopy is the, is the father of, of hyperspectral, but hyperspectral is a commercial term that's come up. It means something specific in terms of the instrument performance. It has to be defined. Um, so other terms and groupings, so we have this broken into spectral, spatial, uh, signal and radiometric, and um, system and operational terminology. And again, seeking definitions for all of these. Um, and then the D1 group, uh, again, three people that are heavily involved in the standards organizations, uh, Deepmar Boker, Naresh uh, Malanahali, and uh, Siri Jodasin Khalsa. Um, data structures is really about what to encode. You've already heard a lot on this, so I won't belabor it, but um, you know, what, what do we put into the data so that the users know what was taken, what instrument, could do, what it couldn't do, how to encode that, um, what formats do we use, um, you know, uh, HDF, NV, you know, there's some de facto kind of standards out there. Um, I know people that love NV, and I know people that hate NV. So NV is not really a standard, but it's certainly available. So how do we contain that and how do we use it? Again, we're not trying to reinvent, we're trying to understand what's, uh, what's out there and what's being used. The stack uh, presentation was really fascinating to me because there's a lot of interesting terminology and, and subcategory and char characterization that actually might be really useful to this effort. So uh, I was very happy to see that. Um, uh, and then other things um, that uh, are going on in the group. Uh, we are relying on other standards groups that are, are actually well along the way here. Uh, for those of you that don't know about the ISO 19115, uh, uh, that's a metadata structure. Uh, there's a lot of good work being done in that group. Um, uh, the ISO 191, uh, 19130, we have liaisons into the group for all these things. So we're aware of what they're doing and we're just trying to lockstep with them. We are not trying to change what they're doing. Um, and then other things for LIDAR and SAR and, you know, on and on. So, um, but then there are subgroups and standards that are already published out there. Uh, again, uh, bring them in, utilize them, don't change them. Uh, just make sure that if there's a specialization for hyperspectral, we basically bring that in and document it. And that's basically it. Um, uh, let, uh, a couple of links there to our groups, and then, again, if this is something you'd like to participate, we welcome anybody's participation. It's an open group. Membership is attending twice, and then you get full voting rights. Um, and uh, you're, uh, just send me an email, and, and we'll get you signed up.
Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Everybody, my name's Steve Covington. Uh, I got drafted to moderate this session. So, if all the, Chris, don't go anywhere. Come on, back, come on back up. If all the speakers could, uh, there are slides? No. No, I do not need them, no. Pull up a chair. Yeah, we have two mics in the middle for Q and A. Please use uh, use those to facilitate the discussion. Thank you. That uh, that uh, not only facilitates a uh, discussion, but remember the the uh, session is being recorded, so your voice, the question won't come through if you don't hit a mic. Okay, that goes for whoever is answering a question. You need the mic to speak. Chris, why don't you hold that? Okay, so we ready to begin? Okay, great. So actually, a really good session, really, uh, really good topics and good discussion. So first of all, let's give a round for everybody for <laughs> good talks. I could ask questions of each of you, and I'm just deciding where to start, and I'm thinking I'm gonna start with hyperspectral just because you came last. And the question actually could go around, but uh, I mean, I was telling somebody in our group before that uh, USGS and NASA are both uh, examining hyperspectral as one of the potential ways to, to go in the future. Uh, and so, because that's fresh in my mind and thinking about the technology challenges of that, some of the things that we kind of run into are what your limited GSD uh, would be because of the signal and noise. You need to collect enough photons to make it worth your while. So there's, question, so there's a technical question, which you probably would be the best one to answer, first of all, on, on the challenges of getting a GSD that people will like, uh, but a signal to noise that makes it useful. Uh, so that is considering band aggregation uh, and things of that nature. So let me, then I'm gonna look at Chris and talk and ask the, be asking the question of, okay, so then say you have a, a spacecraft up there with, an, with, a, um, with an, a single instrument that is doing onboard aggregation. So now from a stack standpoint, and Matt, you probably will have some words there too. From a stack standpoint, you now have one instrument that has variable number of bands and variable band passes that the stack uh, would have to handle. Then the third thing is getting to uh, an end user standpoint of, okay, what's the, what's perceived, and this might not be for this group actually, but the perceived uh, challenges to having a uh, end user community that, go, that has to start looking away from band processing to spectra processing. So there's all sorts of things that come along uh, uh, with hyperspectral. So why don't we start with the technology first? Yeah. Um. So um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of pathfinders that have been uh, flown and are, are now starting to get up onto the space stations like DSIS and uh, uh, Prisma and uh, others that are actually spaceborne. Um, that's, that is the next generation of, of uh, Earth imagers that are, that are coming forward. Um, as far as w what's uh, useful, uh, I don't, I mean, I think the science missions uh, for like, you know, instruments like PACE, and other types of things, you know, they have very specific tasks in mind. How, I, 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 if I, I may or may not be answering the question correctly, but I think a lot of it depends on what that instrument was designed to do and whether it's relevant for that. I mean, they usually try to get as wide a swath as they can or as wide a field as they can uh, without, uh, uh, to get the signal to noise up, but, um, but whether or not that's relevant to your application, or I don't, I don't know, and I don't know if it, until we actually get some some actual data out of these instruments and we start getting some, uh, start correlating that to well understood uh, benchmarks like avarice and other types of things. You know, what is the cross reference there, and how useful is it? Um, I don't know is a short answer. Okay, so we'll we'll save that for beer later because I I could go on with you the entire night. Yeah. <laughs> So let's go to the challenges of stack in, in hyperspectral type of a system where you may or may not have onboard aggregation, so you create that variability in, in what your instrument's actually putting out. Is that, does that create a, it, I'm not a stack guy, so, um, so it's a question I've, I wrote down for myself wondering, looking at hyperspectral, uh, does that create challenges that you currently don't have in how you uh, would build your stack structure for, for that type of a mission? No. 
Yeah. Oh, In one word or less. I, I can complete. Uh, so, I mean, at the item level, it's flexible. So, like, Matt was talking about bands typically are aggregated up, uh, mm -hmm. but they don't have to be. Um, so you can define your bands at each item. So if it's getting a different set of bands from the sensor, you just wouldn't put it at the collection level. And the collection might say, these are the possible bands, but the item would say, this is the bands that I actually have, so. Okay. Still seems like it would be a challenge for the user in, in search criteria, things like that, but. You could say no. Yeah, so oh, I mean yes. that, okay, great. yeah, the challenge there is that we don't, I mean, r r really the real challenge is that we haven't defined how you search objects within the property. So EO bands is a JSON object. And we just, we just don't have in the API where there's no, there's no current mechanism for how to say, oh, I want to find all items that have assets that have a, a wavelength, you know, within this range. Currently, there's no way to do that. Um, so from that sense, from a searching standpoint, um, that's something that we're gonna have to tackle, is th those sorts of complex queries, I'm sure. Yeah, but we tend to want the catalog to exist before we start hypothesizing. So, like, as soon as you all get data from space and did multispectral things, we'll check it out. <laughs> well, but, okay. That's a little bit of a glib response, because from a USGS sure. standpoint, you have to have that solution in place before you fly it. I mean, if we were to, if, if a Landsat 10, this is not necessarily happening, uh, <laughs> be clear about that. If a Landsat 10 turned out to be a, a hyperspectral instrument, we would have to have these kind of problems worked out long before launch. So, so there can't be a catalog, and then they will come. But so just, we'll just, that's a problem we'd have to look at. Yeah, I mean, I think it's from Stack, the focus on search, so, like, define your internal catalog. I mean, and, and Stack's super extensible, so it's basically, you guys use Stack however you want to define whatever terms you want in terms of making it something that everyone understands and searches and becomes an extension that everybody would use. That That's the one we want to wait for. But, like, I mean, the core thing, and, yeah, why Matt said it's not a problem, it's just the core design decisions to be super extensible. So like use right. it for your purposes and then once you start to want that to be searched, surface that up. So it's like very bottom up as opposed to, hey, let's define everything in front of time. Like whatever group makes sense to define in front of time and if that's USGS or USGS science team and you know, do that, but then propose it and then it sort of goes out. And then eventually with the APIs, we're probably not gonna search it until there's a sufficient amount of data that search makes sense, so. Perfect, thanks. We have a question from the audience. Poss possibly. So I have a question about collection two. Um, collection two processing, it will be, we were, we're gonna be geo-referencing the imagery to the global reference image, is that the case? That was developed by ESA. I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part of that question? Yeah, is, is, is the collection two data gonna be geo-referenced to the global reference image? Yes. Uh, uh, my understanding was it was only available in certain parts of the world, so this is going to be global coverage, the entire catalog globally locked down yes. to the GRI. Globally with uh, the UTM projection. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. USGS has already received from ESA a, all the reference scenes necessary in the new GRI um, projection, you know, projected in UTM in the GRI, and we've already, we're in the process of making all our chips. Uh, that will be used for the contra the control for collection two. Is that going to be available publicly, or is it just for internal use of USGS? Uh, it will be available. The the L8 chips will be available publicly. Great. And there, there was a question about processing on the cloud for the new land collection two data, and you made a, a, quite a comment in passing about um, elastic search support. So you're just going to provide the stack catalog, but then. Is, you, is there gonna be elastic search provisioning actually so people can do queries against it or people are gonna have to be index themselves the, the records on their own elastic search capabilities? Right, so we've been working with development seat who's been building a visualization prototype for us and it utilizes the SAT utils, it utilizes stack and the elastic search functionality that they have put together for us. Thank you. Does that answer it? Yes. Okay. 
Any other questions before we move on? Oh, Adam? Uh, Mike? Uh, or Adam, Mike? <laughs> This is a reasonably simple question for probably Chris and Matt. With the, the, uh, the stack catalog concept seems very relevant to the space agencies who are struggling with a, a range of questions on how to make their data more accessible and impactful. One is how to discover it. Uh, and there's a subgroup of CEOS called the Working Group Information Systems and Services, uh, which seems to be, would naturally be interested in this. I wonder if there'd been any interaction with them that you, you know of. Or anybody else knows whether that connection's been made? Yeah, I met some CIOs people here last year, but I'm not sure if they were from that group. Yeah. Ferran was here. Yeah. Uh, introduce me. We're, we are very excited to work with as many people as possible so that we're not yet another group reinventing stuff. So uh, we like to connect. So please connect us. We're going to be connected. Awesome. Uh, one, one question for Chris about the IEEE standard. Is this standard going to exist as a, in a piece of paper, or is, any, or is there any plan to have the standard be reflected in an actual code base? For example, you have camera models, methodologies. Is the standard going to be embodied in like a GitHub repo that contains the language, the ontologies, the code, so people can call, do collaboration and pull requests, or is it going to be more like a document? Um, yeah, well, both, uh, but uh, you know where it's applicable, uh, there'll be there'll be code bases that people can can use and access. Uh, I, I think that's the same is true of ISO standards and stuff like that too. So, we'll be following similar methodologies. Um. I have a question for Pete, actually. If, if since we're since there's a lull in the crowds, uh, this Pete. I'm sorry, <laughs> Pete Dusan. You'd, you'd mentioned in your talk uh, that I think that um, level three products were going to be a driver for AI and ML um, applications. And can you explain what you meant by that? So level three data is, like I was saying in my talk, it's, it's labeled data, right? It's semantic data. And that's what these, uh, these machine learning AI, well, like I was saying, we're really talking about deep neural nets, right? And so they feed on, on labeled data. And uh, that, that's kind of been the turning point for deep, uh, deep learning neural nets is the, the sheer quantity of labeled data has just come through the loop. Now, where that community has gone is mainly, you know, the, the, two, big app, the two big killer apps for machine learning, uh, for, for deep learning, have been voice recognition and uh, pattern recognition in images. And a lot of it is things like facial recognition, looking for cats and dogs, and all kinds of spatial-based pattern recognition, right? There's not a lot of, of energy or, or, or investigation going on for, for time series spectral data, like the CCDC approach. And so I think that, that area is ripe for additional investigation. Another thing I'll say about the CCDC algorithm, uh, which, which you know, we're, we're kind of promoting, the, the code is, is on GitHub. I know that uh, the Google Earth Engine folks have, have coded it up. Uh, so CCDC, uh, bases its its classification of pixels on a per pixel basis on the spectra of it, right? Or the, the coefficients from that from that regression fit. It does not look at surrounding pixels. In other words, it doesn't take spatial context into account. There's a lot of information there because, as as many of us know, spatial data is often auto correlated, or certain natural phenomena are auto spatial correlated, right? And so we're ignoring potentially a lot of good useful information there to make a CCDC type approach much more robust. Now, it really adds an additional layer of complexity when it comes to compute. Now you need these spatial kernels in addition to looking at the spectral information. And so I'm not an IT guy. I don't know what that means to, you know, how you set up the, the compute inf infrastructure for that. But, but spatial is what's really, uh, is what the deep learning is thriving on. We, we, need, to, we need to open that can of worms a little, a little broader. Josh? Um, could be a cr answer, well, question for Chris or Matt regarding stack. Um, with, I think semantic searches are pretty good, but uh, if uh, going down the, the realm of some hyperspectral, if there's a, 
a lot of bands. I don't want to have a look at here's red, red one, red two, or even red midpoint channel. Um, is there any future thinking around something that could be some analytical searches regarding that? So maybe supply some uh, spectral response function to bring me back something that is similar. So if I provide something that say this is the red I'm interested, as um, uh, some part of a, a response function, map up to satellites that are similar to this based on some algorithmic detail? <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> um, you should open a PR for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but seriously, uh, no, that does sound cool. That's exactly the type of thing that I think eventually would be useful. That type of complicated search where right now we're just figuring out like basic search, like, hey, let's find stuff that has cloud cover less than 20%. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that eventually we would we would get there. So I, I believe, and if there are people here that know more about the Avers database than I do, I believe there are search functions like that in the Avers database. So there, there are precedents for that type of work that you could you could use off of those types of benchmarks. Because um, uh, signature identification is pretty important, um, and users will want to look for specific signatures. So, right. Um, does anybody know any, anybody else in the audience know anything about the Avers search function? Okay. Um, since I've still got the mic, um, I also wanted to add. Uh, w there's uh, one of the things that I've also seen too is there's a little bit of a disconnect uh, that we need to work on uh, as a group. Uh, which is the science community, and what the science community is doing, and what the commercial community is doing? Because, like, the is there anybody here from uh, w, the CSIVOS community? You said they were here last year. Uh, the, the, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that there isn't because they're defining, they're off defining their own version of ARD and their and how how to do that. And and uh, I'm I'm trying to to get involved with that and trying to be a, a relay so that so we don't have a disconnect, but. <coughs> Uh, the, the science and the, and, the, and the commercial side have got to stay in lockstep on this, otherwise we're going we're gonna to get in trouble. More to talk over beer. <laughs> Krista, do you have something you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, just building on what Matt said, we're definitely at very much the basics. And then I think the kind of core philosophy is like with a lot of this data searching it has been the provider of the data provides the search. And I think the key thing we're trying to do in Stack is flip that and just get much more data available, like such that it becomes in people's interest to do the search because there's so much data available. Um, so like, yeah, that particular search problem, we were, yeah, we are super psyched on it so far beyond. Like, we're just like, let's get the very basic thing first of get so much data, like actually on the web and searchable that many more people start to search it and like build that ecosystem up. And then from there, we'll be able to build more and more on top of it. But we kind of don't want to get, yeah, stuck on the coolest search thing. So we actually do pretty lame searches, you know, like, but if you search for cloud cover, it'll come back from many places. Um, so we like keep our ambition small to make sure that we kind of become this base building block, like on top of which that type of search could eventually be built, but it's pretty far from where we are right now. Okay, cool. thanks. So I have a question, do you have another question? I've got another question, but I can wait. wait so you just hold that question one second. That's, that's a great thing about being up here. Uh, <laughs> Chris Becker, so I really liked your talk. Um, really concerned me though. Uh, yes, Peter, I said yes, Chris, I'm sorry, Peter. Um, uh, A lot of really good work there on the different formats. You know, the, uh, in, yeah, <laughs> Renee's shaking her head because she, she saw it too. Lots of good information. Um, our collection too, at this point, is, is UTM, um, COGS. Uh, I don't think, well, is there any, is there any compression at all? Yes. <clears throat> so. It's uh, deflate. Deflate. Deflate, okay. So, and you looked at a lot of different things that I don't think we looked at, but 
right now I'm kind of feeling okay with that, but I'd like to get your opinion on that's what collection two will look like. There will be 12 petabytes of data sitting out there in cogs with uh, in cogs with deflate and uh, and you were talking about okay if somebody's going to somebody would probably pull that out and put that into maybe a, a different kind of raster structure for for time series analysis things like that anyway. So I guess the question I would have is from a software provider standpoint who's supporting users. Um, are we okay? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had a number of discussions with some people in the USGS, and yeah, I think w what you're doing is correct. Uh, I think you know, standardizing and cog with deflate is the best is the best standard way to go today. Um, I, I did I raised the question about the pyramids uh, and what the value of those is for the ARD data. I'm not saying cog shouldn't have pyramids; it's just for the ARD data. I'm not so sure those pyramids should go in there. There's going to be a lot of discussions about what type of pyramids are going in there. Right. Uh, so that's the one that I, I would put 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 question on. Uh, it, you know, deflate is good. It's not. It's not the best, but it's everybody can use it. So it's it's a it's a, it's a good way. To, it's a good way to go. And so uh, I think yeah, we're going the right way. Have you guys looked at all for the future at DGGS kind of structures for data storage and processing, and then reproject to somebody's end use? So um, yeah, I mean on the on I mean, I actually re released a paper a couple of a couple of weeks ago, which went on about um, let's say the number of different um, compromises that need to be created to create an ARD data set. I mean, there are so many compromises, you know, just talk about sampling and you can have a discussion for three hours on just mm -hmm. that question. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, whatever, whatever is done, there are going to be compromises that need, need to be made. Um, but I think coming up with some form of a base which can then be used as the input for everything else is good. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we're going, we're going the right way. So, like that kind of talk. Great, thanks. Oh, one, one th the one question I do have is about the tiling. Uh, and some people already know my opinion on that. I'm not in favor of having all the data cut up into tiles. I just see that creating one issue after the other. So, and, you know, we're, and we're not doing that. I know for the level two. The ARD is. No, 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 it's no. Be, be careful. Okay, so let me. Collection two is, is, not, is, is, not, is correct as scenes. Yeah, it's global, global ARD, collection two, is, is scene based. Yes, and you can great. break it up any way you want on Perfect. distribution. So I think that that's, that's, that's an improvement over the ARD from my perspective. Agreed. Matt, oh. Oh, yeah, I was just going to mention about the pyramids. Uh, is, yeah, something that I has sort of bothered me t too is, like, COGS are great. Everybody loves COGS, so I'm going to say something bad about it, which is for a lot of an analysis purposes, like you don't, you don't need those pyramids because you're interested in full resolution data. And so why? You know, there, eventually there's gonna be so much data out there. Like looking at the imagery is pointless. Like people aren't gonna look at all the images, you know? Um, and so maybe, yeah, maybe that requires some more discussion about whether or not it even makes sense to, uh, I mean, it makes sense to have internal tiling because you might, you're gonna process it like that. You're gonna process it in pieces. But for having pyramids that are primarily for visualization or maybe analytics if you wanted to do it some reduced resolution. But for the most part, I think that's an awful lot of storage that could be saved um, if you got rid of them. Um, just one perspective as Planet as a data provider and the particular thing about COGS versus like MRF, which I would say is more cloud native, is we can provide a single file for the legacy QGIS download person as for the cloud. And so it's like once we truly get all our workflows on the cloud, like something like MRF that's more optimized or we collaborate on even more optimized, that's time series, you know, like, like I look forward to that future, but COG to me was this like, like stepping stone but where, as a data provider, I can just provide this one file and meet kind of both because it's a geotiff. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, super excited for like when we truly have 90% of our workflows on the cloud and people are downloading just the bits. Then, yes, let's go nuts. Uh, just just a quick thing about the download aspect. I mean, I I think people are going to not going to be downloading the number of volume of data they're doing at the moment. If they do download, they typically, they typically want it in their own very specific format. So it's actually much better to leave the data in, let's say, COG or something, 
and then have a lambda function that will convert it into x, y, z, or whatever they want, as opposed to trying to continuously have the, a generic format that's, and, and not have it more optimum. So optimize as much as possible and then provide a lambda GDAL function which will convert it into ASCII TIFF, if, you know, an ASCII binary, if that's called ASCII file, if that's what they really want. I mean. okay. um, Hopefully before I do one, we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> So, he's higher up in the organization. No, go Josh first. <laughs> uh, I, mine's a more of a big picture question. So okay, Josh, go ahead. Go Josh first. Uh, they, both, they both speak with an accent. <laughs> uh, for Peter from Esri. Um, so, I played around with some similar compression filters, what you presented today. Um, I've not played or well, tested with Lurk, but I have looked at um, ZFP by Lawrence Livermore um, National Laboratory. So I was getting there at something, I know you mentioned you were getting like one and a half to two times faster than deflate and maybe 12% better compression. Um, with ZFP I was getting something closer to 20% on top of deflate and three, three times faster than um, deflate. But another one, Z standard um, with, from Facebook. So uh, it was only giving similar ratios to deflate but something that was about seven, eight times faster. Directly. Okay, so the, the, the number of times faster depends on which part of the algorithm you're including. Okay. Uh, so this is actually after you've included everything else. Uh, so, the, um, so more than Lurk three? Is, Lurk is actually far, much faster. It's by far the fastest that we've seen yep. uh, than any of the others. Uh, if you look at it, I mean, it's, an op it's open source. Have a look at it. It's extremely, extremely efficient. Uh, so how fast it is really depends on what type of data it is. Um, so whether it's you know, 8-bit um, data or float data. Uh, so it's not a constant, it isn't a constant speed up. Um, but uh, if you look, just try it out and you'll, 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 see, you'll see the difference in performance is, is very significant. Cool, thanks. Thanks. Uh, just just one, one thing, the, um, just, just a little <laughs> bit about Lurk. The key thing about, interesting about Lurk is that it's a controlled lossy Lurk. compression. And that becomes very interesting as, as we talk about the sort of storing everything as 16-bit geotiffs, uh, well, how much, how, how much of that data is actually data and how much of it is noise? <coughs> now, you want it to be returned as 16-bit, but you really need to maintain every single last <coughs> bit. And what Lurk allows you to do is, is to find a tolerance and say that I'm allowing the values to range by a certain amount. And by giving it a little bit of tolerance, it'll actually change some of those values slightly within, hopefully, the noise threshold but by making those changes, you can get significantly better compressions. And that's typically not available in any of the lossless compressions. Most other compressions are either lossless, in other words, you maintain everything, or they're lossy, but then you say, oh, it's a quality of 85, which like, what the hell does that yeah. mean? Uh, so the nice thing about Lurk is you can specifically <laughs> define the tolerance, and it'll make sure that none of the data range varies more than that tolerance. And that goes back to the question about we really need to understand what the signal to noise re 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 signal to noise of the sensors are, and the um, the precision of the data. Because if we can understand that, we can put those tolerances down, and by increasing those tolerances, we can significantly reduce the data volume and speed up the whole processing. Along. So I guess I would say there's maybe a little issue there because there are some data providers who don't give you signal to noise and some of the information you'd like to use to make that a. a, a have an educated uh, assignment of that. Uh. Correct, and that's why at the moment in my, in everything I was showing, I was doing pure lossless, but I would like to get to a point where we, don't, where we can actually use control with lossy as opposed to lossless, right. and that's one of the big advantages. Yeah, I think it's a um, great <coughs> field to explore in because I'm starting to look into it for the interferometry. So here we've been given specifications of must retain at least five decimal places to have millimeter precision. Um, so. It, to me, this is a perfect example to actually start exploring and to see what's required and how much can be lost without really damaging anything. So. Okay, yeah. let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Ignacio promised that this was a point of the uh, day in which we were going to talk about the, the general scope of the workshop and how it all fits together. So I want to get to that point. Um, what we've just heard is a range of really interesting talks on, a, on quite different things. And during the welcome today, we also heard a range of different perspectives from 10 different groups that demonstrate a diversity of perspectives on, on what we're here for, all under the umbrella of ARD 19. So I want to just put the point of view that 
what we're all here, what's in common with all these things is they're all talking about <coughs> what's not yet fixed in the Earth observation supply chain to have impact. Now, we're not talking about the things that are fixed. We're not talking about the fact that there's now high quality instruments that see enough, that they're global coverage and system systematic observations, so they're always looking at our stuff, that they're happening every few days instead of every couple of weeks, so the temporal frequency is there, that they're free so we can afford them, that they're open, li that they're open licensed so we can all share them. All that stuff's solved and we're taking it for granted. It's, that's done, that's fine. So now we're talking about what's next. And I think we should, in order to make this tractable and unmix it, we should start to differentiate the components of that problem because only some of them fit under what I see as ARD, so maybe next year it should be called something else, 20, um, because we shouldn't, separate, I don't want to say we shouldn't be talking about things, but I think the way forward is to try to differentiate. Uh, so for me, AR, the next step, and the one we've been working on with CEOS, and we'll talk about this more on Wednesday, is let's decide that we've got a physical measurement of the land surface uh, and we know where the hell the thing came from, whether or not a particular, particular measurement, i.e. pixel, is something we should use or not, uh, and how accurate is, it is, preferably. Um, so that's the next one step. And so USGS, and we have great talk today, are now doing that. Um, then comes the question, well, hang on, is it in a decent file format? So hence Peter's talk and the, and the COG type discussion. That's a separate, that problem can be taken separately. Um, then there's, well, hang on, can we discover that stuff? Is actually, have the space providers or anybody else put it somewhere where we can find it and utilize it, which it seems to me to be where the stack comes in. So I'm just saying, positing that this, can, this problem can be broken into discrete bits that we can work on without, without, um, without loss, uh, or with, with only decidable loss. <laughs> if we knew how accurate our imagery was, we could decide where to put that filter threshold. Um, so we can break this problem up in, into structured components and take it forward in a way which uh, will avoid us potentially going around in circles. That's my view for the panel and for Ignatio. Thanks, Adam. Um, I think you're right there, but I, I, where I thought you were going to go with that uh, was... You <laughs> <laughs> was to the bar. No. Um, yeah, that's the best place. Yeah. Was uh, towards the fact that, okay, so you have all these data sets and you have mechanisms in place to store and retrieve them uh, efficiently in the cloud, uh, effectively through stack uh, mechanisms in a format that's uh, uh, accessible with ARD, but you can't put them together because you don't have necessarily the the information from the data providers to do the harmonization, to make them, you're getting towards interoperability with the infrastructure, but now the data providers have to come along with the correct information on spectral response, um, spectral characteristics of the sensor, the um, uh, uncertainty, the geometry. geometry. Yep. So there have to be mechanisms to put back to the providers in their own interests what's good or, or not good about the data and the formats that they're setting up and providing the data from. That's yeah. inevitable. Someone, had, someone had here had talked about the fact that you know, Vietnam has got, got data now too and things like that and, and how do you bring that all together? Yeah, I mean, I actually think that mo most of the things you touched on, I mean, the formats, yeah, we can debate on them. The stack, yeah, like we've been working on it for a while. Like I think we actually have much of the container around it. To me, I mean, and I'm pretty new to remote sensing. Like before that, I just did vector geospatial, and to me, it's just like, yeah, get the geometry and radiometry like harmonized and relative to a stack. Where I mean, I know Gopal from Planet will talk on this, but just like for a machine learning is like the user in my mind, you know, and these guys know nothing about the atmosphere. Like, and it's like, why should they, you know? So like, to me, that's the, the biggest chunk for ARD and for this group to really tackle is just what is that sort of harmonized data cube of readings from the earth that someone who doesn't know all this stuff can just start using in their thing. Like, and yeah, I know it's an eye of the holder and everyone does different analysis, but like, for me, there's like, what's that content that goes from the sensors that is consistent um, out? And yeah, it's mostly, to me, co-registration, geometric alignment, radiometry, harmonization, like yeah. ARD, and cl consistent cloud masks that are actually really good. Um, and 
you know, like, you're just like, why do I have to deal with clouds? <laughs> like, uh, like, take them out for me. And yeah, so it's like in the, uh, in the CIOS context, the very clear statement about why do I RD is because you want the 90% of potential users to be able to just grab the data and use it. Uh, and I can point to very competent spatial companies in Australia who will conscious, who will have, who are on record saying, we know there's a lot of information in satellite data, but it's too hard to use. Therefore, we do not use it. Uh, so those are the, it's the unknown users that are the, the users. Um, and there are simple steps to get, to, well, maybe not simple, but steps to get to them. So along the lines of drawing distinctions, as Adam was pointing out, I think there is another distinction between ARD and harmonization, right? Harmonization, we struggle with that, another nebulous term as far as I'm concerned. Integration, fusion, geo-registration, I mean, you know, different communities have adopted different jargon to essentially mean the same thing. So I think the, the kind of layman's person view of what harmonization is, is this stack, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of data sets that have been geometrically aligned and it's stacked so you can you can uh, kind of hypothetically drill down and get the same piece of information on every. So, um, harkening back to the <coughs> days of photogrammetry, in a long lost art of photogrammetry, uh, your, your typical photogrammetry book never mentioned anything about harmonization or integration or fusion or any of these things. The, the way that science worked was to, d to develop a model between ground space and image space, the collinearity equations. Uh, so, and, it, and an elevation model was involved, right? When it when it would involve, uh, you know, uh, registering a pair of images, uh, and there was a process in photogrammetry called point transfer, where you would take one uh, a point on one image and transfer it through the ground space back up to the second image, without ever doing any contorting or warping. Or those words just kind of make me <laughs> make my skin crawl here. People warping <laughs> things, you know, these two D to two D polynomial transformations that don't involve a ground space. And uh, uh, you know, you're not propagating air, you don't understand how air propagates. You, you start getting into some scary possibilities there when, you know, I mean, th these types of, of transformation models, these 2D to 2D work great in a flat, in a flat universe. But of course, we, you know, we don't live on that. Right. So, so I think the stack is well postured for capturing these sensor model. In fact, there is a community sensor model group that promotes this idea of capturing uh, sensor model information that puts the onus on the vendors, on the, on the sensor vendors to provide that camera calibration information so that you know, these kinds of ground to, uh, to image space uh, transformations can be captured without doing any kind of contorting of the image. But it, it's a big exercise in indexing. <coughs> I'd offer that up. I think that sounds awesome. From a user, I'm okay with some contorting if I get some data that <laughs> <laughs> like actually aligns to the level that I know. I would much prefer like the scientists like get that and nail that, but like like if my options are nothing, figure that out myself, or that contort, I will definitely take contortion. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that it, it's usually a you know when when you don't when you don't either have the background in, in using the photogrammetry, you'll go to the easy transformations, the 2D to 2D, and quick and dirty, that, that works. And you can't propagate error with that, but you know, for many uh, applications where the terrain is relatively flat, you, you can get away with that. Yeah, I, I want to add a quick comment there. I mean, this is something we're looking in our group a lot, which is, yeah, it's just rigorous geometry, right? And a lot of the mapping applications use these 2D transforms that create a lot of artifacts. So I'm not, I would say it's not a luxury. I think it's, it is a requirement because otherwise you can never get past into 3D, 3D products or anything like that because you have these two-dimensional images that are not accurate. So mm -hmm. I would argue it's kind of a requirement for the field to move forward into point clouds and beyond the raster, which is a conversation we haven't tackled, mm. which is point cloud data abstraction layers and a path to incorporate ground measurements and other types of data points from the ground that are not rasters. So, so I guess that's a question to the audience. What about point, you know, point data abstraction layers? There's PDAL, there's all these other things coming up. How do we, how do we go away from rasters, which are a construct? I mean, to me, the biggest thing is don't let great be the enemy of good. Like, I agree that future is awesome, but if like all the machine learning people that is like users growing exponentially are just gonna get crappy data anyways and get worse data, like get something. <clears throat> like 
I am all for talk, like the proper things, just also like what's that minimum viable product that can be put out to a wider audience that is way better than what exists today, which is like them randomly like making stuff. <laughs> Space LiDAR might take us into that realm. What, sorry? Space LiDAR might take us into that realm. The future is yeah. here. I said too, what's your analysis ready data product? Yeah. Uh, so going back to the big picture, sorry, not the point cloud stuff, um, but just thinking out loud here, like, I mean, this, I feel like there's enough ideas here where there could be an ARD stack extension that describes some of the uncertainties around this data um, and and the processing level like just having a, a table and a and a defined standard for not just processing levels but but maybe recommendations for accuracies like perhaps graded somehow because if you provide accuracy uncertainty estimates to end users um, who don't know anything about this, that's probably not all that helpful either, right? Like, I don't want to see, as an end user, I don't want to see, like, numbers of what the geometric accuracy is, but it may be if somehow they're categorized so that I know that this data and this data are somewhat on the same level in terms of uncertainties, maybe, maybe that's useful. We'll let us like, redo that. We'll let us redo that. Yeah, I, I, think as, I think as the data providers, we want to provide the, the facts, ma'am, uh, and and let the end user figure it out. Like we were talking in the group, you, 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 you start, if you need a certain density of observations, you start with the best quality and then fill in with lesser quality and lesser quality until you have the density of observations you need for the application you're running. And it's up to the end user who understands the application they're running or the, or the software vendor who's providing them the software to run that to figure that out. Yeah, okay, so just, just a couple of comments on that. I mean, I think we need to understand the scope of what we, when we talk about ARD, the scope of who we're talking to. I think we need to sort of look at the whole industry in three different groups. There is the data providers. They're really only interested about their sensor and making their data available, to be honest. That's their, that's what their business is. It's take a satellite, fly it, and make the data available. I, I disagree, that's, I disagree right. with that's, that. That's, 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 their, that's their key. The second one is the data scientist. That's not true. Let's, let's stop on your first one before you go beyond that, because as a data provider, as that a, isn't our view. You, you, yeah, as a USGS, you are a, 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 certainly an exception when it comes to most of the other data providers. And we're not talking, we're talking about drone companies and um, aero Please. companies okay. and people like that. Their main interest really is to fly their, set, fly their center, make their data available, and make sure that it is used by as many people as possible. That's, that's, their, that's their aim, and their scope is pretty well defined. Then you have the data scientists, and I think that's really the community that the ARD is really focused on. It's the data scientist who, re needs to who wants the data, needs to understand what that data is, needs to understand the provenance of the data, needs to know the accuracy of the data, needs to be able to confidently make a decision as to what they're going to do with that data to create a product. Their key output is typically a product. I mean, LC Map is a beautiful example of that. It's a product which is a well, it's a well defined product. From the end user perspective, they want to then use that product, understand what that product is. They don't really want to know all the details that came, came, came from it. So let's, let's look at a totally different industry. Look at the, for example, the oil industry. It's also broken up into those, into those groups. The people who dig, who pull the oil out of the ground are the people who actually process it and make it into different fuels with different grades. And they're the people who actually use it. When I pour petrol into my car, I don't know whether it came from a fracking or from Saudi Arabia or Iran. All I know is it's a particular grade of, grade of product. Yes, <laughs> I don't need to know as an end user because that industry has already standardized the fuel into specific types of fuel and we know what it is. Yeah, I know what it is. I don't need to know where it is. And we need to work on how do we create those data products that the end users don't need to know where it came from. They understand what the use of that product is and how it is, brings value to them. <coughs> and then, and if we can get to that point, then the number of users using those products is going to increase significantly. So yeah. while well, you're passing over the mic, I'll say, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with this, and I guess this, this will probably become yeah, a beer I, conversation, I but let me just real quickly, the, the anecdotal user I always like to think of is the, the county planner who needs to know how much corn was planted in, my, in the fields of my county this year. So they have a shape file of, of their, 
uh, of their county, and, and they were going to want to go out into the cloud and say, tell me how much corn there is and where it's located in my county this year. And, and they're going to need an, an, an ARD products, but <coughs> the fact that Sentinel and Landsat and maybe ResourceSat will all have uh, yeah, we'll all have be on, in an ARD format and stack uh, um, uh, searchable means that some application will go out, find all the variable sources of that data for the county that are out there, will run an algorithm that looks at the phenology and can say, I know with 98% accuracy, this is where all the corn is in your county, here's the planimetric information and good things like that. And it's all made possible by the ARD. That's not the scientist, that's an application. So I'm thinking from your standpoint, you would rather know that so you'd rather you want the ARD yeah I mean I, yeah, I think I'm with Peter on this one like <laughs> like I mean yeah sure we could have but that's the thing it's like it's not in the scope of S3 to define grade A B and C you know like like and and to take that 98.2 percent in the number of carbon and put it out it's on all of us you know like we sort of all need to both software and data provider like get to those grades you know that that end consumer can use so it's like like, yes, we could say it's all S3, but I think I, I've seen the geospatial world a lot of, yeah, like somebody else will handle that hard problem. Like a lot of like WFS and searching for data, it's like, oh yeah, put it, push it to somebody else. And I, I think that's the thing is like, oh yeah, the applications will probably, but the applications are like, I'm not gonna code, encode every single error propagation into this. Like I, like, I know the application providers, that's where I've been. Like they just want, give me good data and get this. So I think it's like, yep. like, it's easy to pass the buck to somebody else, but I think it is actually everyone here, and it's all of us. It's not just S3 or just the data provider. Okay, I'm going to say it's it's 602, and so you guys are both standing there. If you're, are you going to say leave the stage, or what are you going to say? No, I'll just add a quick comment and response, which is oh, cool. I think data providers we we do care about ARD because the lack of a standardization gets in the way of the data being sure. adopted. So we're in the interest of standardizing so the market can be competitive, things can be compared, and also ARD or the attributes are measures of image quality. So interoperability is a measure of product quality. So, yeah. ARD is really what brings the connection between the data providers and the end users. It's the critical component in the middle. Yeah. The primary user of that is the data scientist. And, but it's, it's, Absolutely. it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, critical. Yeah. I mean, it's the critical component between getting the data from the data provider to the end user. We need to try and work out how do we get it into a form that the end user can really use it and doesn't have to understand everything about it. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, but, but I think it's our job here to absorb that complexity yep. and spit out two or three products that we all agree what they are. Correct. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to have to cut you off there, sir. No, no, it's fine. I think we need to go get dinner, potentially, yeah, so, be, unless before, there's any more questions. So first of all, again, thanks to the panel. <laughs> and then I have found on the, on the floor this uh, really nice European space imaging pen that someone may want back. If not, I'm keeping it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>